lead the way. Piggy's way effortlessly through the traffic with just over two and a half hours remaining. So I did notice that they were actually, it looks like they were clipping something on the left-hand side of the car, or at least the left-hand side of our picture. So that would have been the right-hand side of the car towards the front end of the vehicle. But if they're doing such a quick turnaround, it can't have been anything to do with the tyres, it can't have been a loose lug nut or anything like that, because of course they're using the single one here. So that begs the question, what exactly happened and why did they come in after just not even a full lap of racing there when the 25 was released, because of course they came back in. No driver change, no new tyres and no fuel in that car either. Yeah, so maybe just checking something out, just checking that the wheel was seated correctly and if it was, then I'd have been happy. It's a Go peculiar on. one, this, because on. everyone, every member of the team that I sort of approach, they they look away <laughs> when I'm getting Ma most, most people do with you, Alan. Yeah, it's a, it's a skill <laughs> that they've perfected over the years, and, and they're terribly good at it, but I, I get the feeling that no-one really wants to talk to me. We'll talk to you, Al. I, I, again, for, this is for at least another I've... For at least another two and a half hours, but yeah, no more than that. True. That's, yeah, that's no, your lot, right I'm too. afraid. Yeah, quite right, too. <laughs> 20 now comes into the pit lane. This is another AF course car that's come in. Uh, and this is a this is their how many of pit stop is their 16th pit stop here. Christian Colombo behind the wheel of that car. The uh, of course the Ferrari 296 GT3 making its uh, debut here in the United Arab Emirates. We've not seen this car out on track uh, before here at the AS Marina circuit or in the Dubai Autodrome. Of course, it's here. There's actually quite a few of them in the field. I think there's five of them in total. Yes, they are. They're both. They're all 3 liter twin turbo V6s with around 600 horsepower each. Uh, and of course, there is a driver change now as uh, uh, Christian gets out of the car. I didn't quite catch who were getting behind the wheel of that car. Can That's you? Steph Stefan Lemery. And there we go. There's confirmation of who will hop behind the wheel because, of course, you see him patiently waiting there as the car is being refueled. They cannot get behind the wheel until the car has been refueled. And there you go. You see the seat insert being rushed over. And then, of course, the next driver now will slot into that driver's seat. Uh, the uh, team there will help him uh, strap himself in as well, make sure the belts are tight uh, before they get going again, because we have seen that before. Uh, we did see a driver come back in because the seat belts were not fastened correctly, and that cost them, of course, additional time on track, and they lost out. Now, for the MP Racing car, they've actually got past uh, Nico Manilangeli's car in the pit lane, so they uh, clawed back at least, I think it was about six laps, they got back on them because they were further back behind them, but now they've moved up into 20th position overall. Nicola Manilangeli's car, the 51, has still not got back out there. We have not seen an update for that car either, and as Mark and Alan suggested before, they don't seem to be in a rush to uh, get that car back out. Maybe in the last hour or so, we might see it go out. No, no one's working on the car. It's uh, it's all alone in the garage. It uh, makes a very solitary figure, I'm afraid. Yeah, so it looks as though that one's done for. No official news, but they'd be working on it if it was repairable. So it looks as though they are um, out and therefore not officially, but that's another potential retirement. So, um, the lead advantage has just come down over the last few laps. It's gone back up again now to around about a 10 and 3 quarter second. But it's all just ebbing and flowing more than anything to do with the traffic, I think, more than anything. So Mikel Grenier going as quickly as he can, then makes a bit of traffic and loses a bit of time on a lap. Nick Yellily going quicker on that lap, but then loses time maybe the next lap. And therefore, it's like a piece of elastic, the gap between the pair of them. But it is still the Grupa M, yellow number 99, Mercedes, in the hands of Mikel Grenier that leads the way here. It's uh, been leading for quite some time now. The only other laps that it led was the very first lap of the race, Alan. Because I, uh, the, 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 there's no uh, members of the team working on the car now, I can have a look at the back of the 51 Ferrari, and it's a very sad tale, and I understand why they shrugged and uh, looked rather despondent and, and walked away from the car. Um, I mean, it, it is crumpled at the back to, um, to the extent that the, um, the exhaust pipes aren't pipes. They are flat pieces of metal, so uh, very disappointing. But, um, yeah, you can understand there'll be way too much work to get that car turned around. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, I thought at the time that we were probably done for with that one. We've got a few drivers out there that have done quite long stints at the moment and may well be destined for the pit lane before too much longer. The fourth place, number 27, Ollie Milroy, driven Watson Motorsport McLaren, is now the best part of an hour and 40 minutes into his stint. Dominic Bauman, who's running in seventh place in the number 75 Sun Energy Mercedes, is also on a similar number, around about 100 uh, one hour and 40 minutes. And we've also got Axel Jeffries, uh, car number 26 for Racing One, at a circuit he knows well. He is also now well into his stint, another what, hour and 40 minutes that he's been behind the wheel. So those three drivers, possibly the next ones coming to come into the pit lane, albeit 
Despite a few visits to the pit stops during his stint, number 25, Giorgio Senegiotto, was also the best part of now an hour and a quarter into his stint. That 26 car, we've got to remember, has to be stationary for an additional five seconds as well because they have that penalty to deal with it for track limits. Now, we're not, it's not confirmed yet, but this car that we're looking at, what we were looking at before the 51 car, may not continue the race at all. As you can see, the car is not being worked on. Now, I want to go back to something that you and David were talking about before, about two hours or so ago, the amount of laps that we could possibly complete here. We've just completed now 270 laps here yeah. around the Aspirina circuit. Longest we've ever gone is 359. Shortest is 300. And on average, over the past 12 races that we've had here for the Lenovo Golf 12 hours, it's about 319 laps that we've completed. So, of course, that's a target to go past the average. But do you think we'll be able to go all the way through to that 359 mark? No, not at all. No, I think because of the extended safety car periods that we had, uh, I don't think we'll be, uh, we'll be able to do it. When we did 359 laps, we only had um, under 26 minutes of safety car, and there was only one safety car period. Well, we've had, what, three already in this race, four of them, if not, um, either full course yellows or safety cars. So I just simply don't think we'll get there. Uh, and, of course, you know, the circuit was slightly slightly longer amazingly when we um, had the uh, previous iterations of it so 2022 slightly shorter circuits not surprising we got more laps in so uh, what was it it's something 1178 miles of racing were completed by uh, the winning car on that occasion car 77 will receive a penalty five seconds at the next pit stop for track limits. Now, we know, we know that the uh, team manager was summoned to the steward's office. So, of course, that has been decided and they will receive a penalty. As uh, Dustin Blackler now comes across the line in the 21. A drive-through penalty now has popped up on the screen for car number seven. And uh, that is the Herbert Motorsport for Ralph Bond. It just says pit stop infringement. So, I would assume that's because they've been in and out of the pit lane too fast at some point. Now, they're not showing up on our screen, so this might have been an issue a bit long, uh, uh, quite some time ago. I would imagine that's probably on totting up that they have done a pit stop that's too short for more than once, more than twice, and a third time, which is why it then becomes a, uh, a drive-through penalty. Potentially something like that could also be the case as well. So what have we got? We've got under two and a half hours of the race to go. And we've got Mercedes, BMW, Mercedes, McLaren now, the top four, the leading Porsche, is down there in sixth position. The leading Ferrari is now way, way down there in 12th position, Axel Jeffrey. So Ferrari aren't quite having the look here that they've had with the likes of the uh, the 458 and the 488 over the year. But of course, it is still a very, very new car. The Ferrari 296 made its debut earlier on this season when it was first released by Ferrari. And whether it be a GT3 specification or challenge spec has been reasonably successful this year with wins at the Nürburgring 24 hour, uh, amongst uh, other things as well. But it is still a car that is um, you know, a car that teams will be learning this weekend because you know, they've got no data to go back on, Chris. First time they've been on track with the 296 here at Yas Marina you start learning as soon as you put the car on track, because each track is very different. Of course, and of course, this is great data for them as well, and it's great for them to, to end the season like this, to end on a high, getting all this information and with six cars in the field. That's plenty of data for all the Ferrari teams to kind of come together and figure out what works, what doesn't work, etc., etc. We've just seen the car number seven working its way through the pit lane to service drive-through penalty. Uh, that seems to be they've done it as soon as it popped up on the screen. So that's done and dusted. They don't have to wait. Of course, that doesn't count towards the, one of their mandatory pit stops. I think they've done, well, they've done well over 10 already. Their previous pit stop was actually 140. Well, now it's showing on our screens 21 seconds because, of course, they went in and out. But it wasn't the previous one. So as Mark said before, this is from a previous pit stop that could have been taken place two or three stops ago. And, of course, this is the stewards calculating it and then adding the penalty where it needs to apply to ensure that everyone is following the rules. Don't get too confused with the number of pit stops because, of course, there was a period of the race where the cars were not allowed to go over the start-finish line. They were brought down the pit lane by the safety car for about four or five laps and every time they did that it's added another number to the pit stop so that's purely the amount of times the cars have been through the pit lane albeit half a dozen of those were under safety car conditions because the track was blocked at turn one they couldn't use it and of course all the pit stops are in the full course yellow don't count either those have also shown up on our timing screens here as well racing one's number 26 moves up due to the uh, Herbert Motorsport car being in the pit lane doing its drive-through penalty. They're moving them up into 11th, but in turn, they also have a penalty to deal with when they come in to do their pit stop. Now, up front, the gap has gone up to around 12-ish seconds as uh, the 46 comes across line now. It's 12.8 seconds to the good. And unfortunately, last time round there, the 46 was two-tenths of a second slower or just 
under two tenths of a second slower compared to our race leader. So unfortunately, no time gain there. What has been happening is that uh, uh, Fabian Schiller has been pulling ever more away from the race leader. So the car that was in third place just on the lead lap is still only just on the lead lap. But rather than being sort of three seconds ahead, he's now nearly five seconds ahead. But that's been hard work for Fabian Schiller to get there. Uh, another thing we need to keep an eye on as well is what's going on for eighth, for ninth, for tenth and for 11th places, because all of those cars are on the same lap at the moment. The number 88 garage 59 McLaren of Alexander West has Ian Loggy not too far away from him. Then you've got Axel Jeffries next up at the wheel of the Racing One Ferrari, and then Scott Andrews at the wheel of the Kessel Racing Ferrari. And all of those three cars or four cars are within about seven seconds of each other. So that's what we need to keep an eye on at the moment as we, for the moment, just keep an eye on what Kevin C is doing at the wheel of the Sky Tempesta Racing, number 93 McLaren, that sits there in eighth position overall. This is the car that is third in Pro-Am. It is also eligible for points in the Intercontinental GT Challenge, and it is also a car that is important in terms of what's going on in the Independence Cup standings as well because Jonathan Hoy shares this car with Kevin C and Jonathan Hoy, as long as he finishes the race now, is going to be crowned, subject to official confirmation, the Independence Cup champion in the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli for this year. And it seems to be there's about a straightaway now between the 99 and 14. It's both just come across the line now. Uh, so it seems to be that uh, the Mercedes AMG Team 2C's motorsport car is now starting to pick up the pace. But of course, traffic is not helping him whatsoever. We did have a comment here before uh, what happened to the 32 car. So the Team WRT 32 had an issue with the exhaust uh, a couple of hours ago. The team have got that fixed. The driver actually uh, noted that there was a funny noise inside the car. They checked the exhaust. That was the issue. And of course, they, uh, uh, they sorted that out and now they're at the tail end of the field almost because they're in 17th. Car number uh, 88 is in the pit lane. Remember, our, one of our race leaders, not to uh, the beginning of the race, is Alexander West, who's come in in the 12. Now, is there a driver waiting for him? No, there isn't by the looks of it. Uh, so no driver change here. Alexander West will stay behind the wheel of the 88 for the foreseeable future, but no doubt he'll come in towards the end of uh, the 12 hours here as the car collection motorsport another one of our race leaders now works their way across the line that's the 21 car uh, there of dustin blattner who uh, is now circulating in sixth position currently 33.9 seconds back uh, from the uh, same car that's on the, the same lap that he is and that's the in fourth position that's the optimum motorsports of ollie milroy uh, in terms of where he is behind fifth position he's around 20, oh no, 19 seconds actually between those two cars there for the time being of uh, uh, Frankie Bird and Dustin Blattner. Now Sky Tempsters uh, number 93 will also come across the line now. They're currently in eighth position as well. And well, they've actually been behind the wheel for quite some time. It's one hour and three minutes. And actually that car comes in right now into the pit lane as a number 93. And this time round there is a driver change that will happen for that car. Uh, the reason it hasn't happened for the 88 is because Alexander West won't have yet hit the minimum driving time. That is a Pro-Am combination, but it's got a platinum, a silver, and Al Alexander West is the bronze driver in it. And as uh, that is a combination, the minimum bronze time uh, can be 4 hours and 20 minutes. So that's the amount of time that Alexander West has to do behind the wheel of that car. And as he hasn't done it, they will service the car, send it back out to make sure he clicks that minimum driving time for the bronze in a Pro-Am combo. So the door shuts there on the number 93, driver change done. And uh, well, while the car is being refueled, actually no, sorry, the driver change has not been done. The driver got out of the car, because remember, they're not allowed to do the driver change while the car is being refueled. Now both drivers are hopping back towards the door of the 93. They've opened it up, and now we'll strap the new driver in. Eddie Cheever going in. That was a good spot there, Mark. Crash helmet. Same as, his, same as his dad's with the star on the side, as he used to be his father. Fair enough. So Eddie Chief now behind the wheel of the number 93, and they will drop down from eight, because, of course, racing one, Axel Jeffries will go past them. Axel Jeffries behind the wheel of one for an hour and 48 minutes, as uh, uh, Mark said a couple of laps ago. They definitely owe us a pit stop in the coming laps. Uh, Dominic Bauman also would come in and do a, a possible driver change as well. He's been behind the wheel for one hour and 49 minutes, as had the Optimus Ford of Ollie Milroy. Our leaders have also been behind the wheel for over an hour. Actually, our top three, all three drivers, have been behind the wheel for over an hour as well because uh, Fabian Schiller's car, uh, Fabian Schiller's just done that hour mark as well. A uh, number of other drivers also uh, reaching past the hour mark here as well. Uh, the number 33, uh, we have the 
uh, number 88 car as well that hasn't done the driver change. So Alexander West, as Mark said, uh, needs to get that minimum drive time in for him to continue on. As uh, he has been released now from his pit box and out of the pit lane he goes, as does the 93 as well. Well, we know that the top three cars in this race, the Mikel Grenier number 99 Mercedes, the Nick Yellowly number 46 BMW, the Fabian Schiller number 14 two C's Mercedes all have done eight of their imposed pit stops at the moment so they've still got two more to do they are all about an hour and five minutes ish into their stops and there is two hours and 18 minutes to go so if they go to sort of even out this next couple of stops the next five or ten minutes will be the time to come in and do them but it really depends on the driving that each one of them has done as they're all pro combinations we don't need to worry it's maximum driving time that we need to worry about there's no minimum driving time in the pro combinations so if they want to even them out yes come in in the next five minutes if they believe that one driver at this stage of the race with the conditions that the track and the air temperature is in is going to be the one that would have the upper hand you might alter and not equate it evenly and push the arguably the quicker driver in for the longer stint but they're all pro cars and therefore there's not a great deal to choose between any of the drivers car number 11 the team manager being summoned to the stewards office uh, fourth infringement there for track limits so no doubt a penalty coming there for car number 11 that's Kessel Racing Scott Andrews who is now up into ninth position there's two series motorsports Ian Loggie's had a problem because he's lost three positions and that car did not come into the pit lane at all racing one uh, the Kessel Racing number 11 Herbert Motorsport 33 have all gone through. Now, whereas Ian Loggy had a problem, well, he's just gone across the sector timing line of sector one, so we can't see where he had that issue. So it might have been on the previous lap, either through turn two or turn three. So a possible late-breaking manoeuvre there from Ian Loggy. Yeah, Matteo Carioli gone through. Scott Andrews was not that far up the road as well. So uh, he's lost a bit of time, but if he can get his head down again once more, Ian Loggy, and close up a couple of seconds, he'll be hot on the heels of one of the cars that's just taken a position away from him. The squabble we're looking at at the moment is uh, Alexander West, who is desperately, desperately trying to keep at bay the car behind him, which is going to be the number 26 Ferrari, which bounces its way in the hands of Axel Jeffries over the kerbs. This is not for position. Axel Jeffries is running in eighth position. Alexander West is running down in 16th position at the moment. So arguably, Alex ought to be getting out of the way and allowing Axel Jeffries to thread his way through. So it's the car that's third in Pro-Am that is trying to work its way past the car that is eighth in Pro-Am at the moment. But Alexander West, as they head up towards Turn 1, with two and a quarter hours to go, is having none of it at this stage. Flash of the lights from Axel Jeffries, but Alexander West will not bother looking and worrying about that. So Axel Jeffries is going to try around the outside at turn three. The left-hand kink at turn number four is not going to offer an overtaking opportunity, but the braking area for turn five might do, and he jinks out from behind to the left-hand side of the McLaren, sneaks his way up the inside at turn number five. Job done, Axel Jeffries gets past back marker. And of course, being a driving instructor here at the Ass Marina circuit, uh, Axel Jeffries knows each and every trick in the book. He knows exactly where to pick and choose the uh, the braking points, acceleration zones and everything like that. He knows everything through and through. Uh, second in Pro-Am is in the pit lane. Dominic Bauman is in the 75. Now that's a driver change presumably going on for that car as well. Long old um, stint, wasn't it, for Dominic? It certainly was. It was well over an hour. It's actually showing his... No, Axel Jeffries is behind the wheel for one hour and 53 minutes, as has uh, Optima Motorsports' Oli Milroy. So those two definitely need to come in at some point and do uh, a driver change uh, in, uh, well, not, not the so foreseeable future. They'll have to come in a lot earlier. Uh, number 93 has been reported to the stewards' office. Uh, well, that's the team manager for the fourth track limit infringement, so possibly another penalty. <laughs> that's Sky Tempster, Eddie Cheever. Now, I wonder if he's just picked that up as well. Uh, uh, it makes you wonder, because every time that Eddie Cheever has been behind the wheel of that car, that's when it's picked up track limits warnings. Um, and Eddie Cheever was, um, was picking them up in the first part of the race. Of course, the slate got wiped clean at the six-hour mark, and who was the first driver to pick up another warning in that car? Eddie Cheever. Uh, he's not long been on board. What's he done? Picked up another warning. I haven't had my Ollie Milroy conversation, have I? You this haven't, is, um, but, but it must be imminent, Alan, because he's been in the car for nearly two hours. It is remiss of me. I need to get myself at the correct end of the pit lane because we've only got two hours and 14 minutes. I, I've, got some, I've got loads to talk about. Well, there's a lot to catch up on because he's had some, some brilliant stints and, and on the whole, you know, that car has gone beautifully well. You, you always expect Ollie would go well in it and Rob Bell, but Mark Ratcliffe has been a, a sensation for me. He's superb. Double he? stinting yes. earlier on and two other good single stints from so, him. So we've spoken to Mark, somebody I've never spoken to before, but I haven't spoken to 
to Rob or to Ollie, two guys that I've known since they started racing. So I need to put this. Um, uh, I need to put this right. I shall head up towards their garage. You need to correct that at some point. Into the pit lane comes Ian Loggy. So the car that is running second place in the AM category, the Two Seas Motorsport car, is going to be vacated by him. And Chris, based on the conversations that uh, you have had, who's likely to be jumping on board that if looks there's a driver like, change? That looks like our Faisal al is getting ready because he's done his stint already earlier today and he's only doing about two hours behind right. the wheel. He did tell me that before the race would end that he would get uh, back behind the wheel of that Two Seas Motorsport Motorsport number three, and he has done that right now. So that'll move for the Herbert Motorsport number 33 up the order. Philip Ellis is back behind the wheel of the 75 now in the Sun Energy 1 car. They are seventh overall. Uh, a gap up front, though, is now up to 13 seconds between uh, the 99 and 46. Uh, the gap has also increased between the 99 and 14 for the 14 to stay on the lead lap. That's gone up now to about six-ish seconds separating those two cars now. So, of course, uh, traffic playing a key factor in this, but also it's quite a lot of time behind the wheel of that car as well for both drivers. And actually, race leader, the 99, is in the pit lane, and it looks like we're going to have a driver change as well here for Mikel. He's going to get out of the car, and who will it be that gets behind the wheel of that number 99? Who do you think it will be? I think it may well be uh, Lucas Stoltz behind the wheel, unless they're going to double stint Mauro Engel. Um, you'd like to think they'd hang on to Mauro for the final stint, but Lucas Stoltz may well be dropping in. So, and that they have done what I thought they would do. They have roughly going to even out these two final pit stops. So this is uh, the imposed pit stop number nine coming in for them with two hours and 15 minutes to go, which means there's only another hour and a half of imposed pit stops that can be taken now because once we get to the final 45 minutes of the race, no more imposed pit stops can be done. You have to have ticked off all 10 imposed pit stops before you get to the 11 hour and 15 minute mark of this running of the Lenovo Gulf 12 hours, the final round of the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli. Uh, second place is also in the pit lane. Team WRT is in the 46. There it is. Uh, driver change for them as well. Uh, now, who is that that is getting into the car? Dries Van Tour, I think, getting into yeah. the car. And what, from what I've de deduced uh, about this pedal box situation with the 46 car, um, it is in um, the shortest leg mode. Oh, no. Um, so, so, no, that's good for Dries well, Van Tour. <laughs> So, 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 Dries is the one um, where, where, that will uh, have the, the pedal box in the, in the ideal position. position. Um, but for, for Valentino and for, for Nick, it's, um, it's a, it, absolute agony from what I can see well, from, from Nick, who's out of the car. He's in the garage at the moment. One of his legs is completely straight, it's his left leg. And I mean, I mean Valentino is, is looking on, he's been over to talk to Nick, and he has just applauded Nick on the stint that he's just put in because I, I, I gather just by looking at Nick's face that, that, that it is approaching agony in his left I, leg. I totally get that, totally get that. You have to be in the right driving position when you're driving one of these cars and being too close to the wheel is as uncomfortable and as dangerous as not being close enough to it because you know if you're not close enough to it you can't press the brake pedal hard enough or get your full throttle down but if you're too close to it it is unbelievably uncomfortable i'm talking from a position of experience there we've had all the top three in as well so you might have had dries van Thor uh, taking over the bmw we've now got maro engel who has taken over the race leading number 99 uh, Group of M Mercedes, but we've also got Fabian Schiller in the pit lane now as well, and that will be a change for two C's as well with a driver change going on. And all of these now are ticking off their penultimate imposed pit stop, their ninth pit stop. So there'll be just one more to do after this one, so they'll leave these cars out. One would have thought, Alan, for about another hour before they I'm, tick off the final I'm, one. I'm not. I'm not going to put a camera on Nick Yellowley, but I, I, I will just get a get a word. Nick, I can see you're in absolute agony with your left leg. So the pedal box is in its shortest possible position, is it? Is that right? You've done the, the whole of the stint that way. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Um, so it'll be okay for Dries, obviously, because he's shorter. So naturally, we wanted to try and chase the Mercedes down. But yeah, that's it's the reason for the slow stops. We were trying to get the pedal box further away, and yeah, it, unfortunately, the mechanism had broke. So. Do you need to be sitting down or standing up, or what can you do? Uh, I go for a beer, and then I'll be yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great decision. Nick, thanks for talking to us. So there you go. It's it, it, it's okay for Dries. He is the the um, the shortest of the three drivers, but for for Valet, now I understand what all of the 
um, uh, gesticulation was when he got out of the car. He was in a huge amount of discomfort. And, and Nick Yellowley is the tallest of drivers. He's in absolute agony, I think. Uh, and I can totally understand why, yeah. So at least for Dries Van Thor, if they're going to double stint him now, then that's probably the best thing to do. And if that wasn't the process that they were thinking about doing as their driver rotor for it, then I'm sure Team WRT I, may well have changed that to ensure I, that he's comfortable. I think I understood that Valet was going to be at the wheel at the end of the race, but um, uh, you know what, that may well change. I, uh, yeah. Totally agree, Alan. That's ex if I was a team manager, that's exactly what I would be doing. And, and Valet will be probably more than happy not to get back in the car. He'd be disappointed, but wow, if it's going to be uncomfortable for dri to drive and it's in the position that suits Dries Van Tour, leave Dries in it. And uh, it's uh, Jules Gunon has got behind the wheel of the 14. Uh, penalties for car 11 and 93. Five seconds time penalty will be added, or that should be stationary during the next pit stop for track limit. Uh, the second of the Team WRT cars, Charles Wurtz, is in the pit lane as well. I presume they're doing a driver change for the second of the BMWs. It looks like the 93 of Eddie Chiba is going to come back in the pit lane. The team are ready to receive him when he comes through. Now, he hasn't been out too long. Now, I wonder what they're doing here. Do you think this is them trying to catch up to their 10th pit stop that they need to achieve? Uh, quite possibly, yeah, quite possibly. They haven't quite ticked it off as yet. So we've, we've lost track with all of the shenanigans of the pit lane being used for the racetrack for a period of time whilst Turn 1 was blocked. We've lost track a little bit of how many imposed pit stops everybody has done. I can confirm that the top three in this race have all now done nine, as into the pit lane comes 93. the Sky Tempesta racing car of Eddie Cheever and he comes into the pit lane, only having been behind the wheel for 11 minutes. And there is, by the look of things, inspection going on around the right front wheel of the car. So that may well have been reported back from Eddie that brake performance isn't quite what it ought to be. Or they are going to change the pads and the discs on the car and in turn also then tick off one of their imposed pit stops. But looks as though, is that the dolly that was going underneath? Or, no, or, or is it? I think it is, yeah, thumbs up from Chris. Yeah, you're right, there's one there underneath the left front, we can just see it from a position there. So you're right, I think they're checking the brakes there, there's something wrong with it, they're trying to pull it out by the looks of it, there's something stuck on that side. So I think they're doing a brake inspection on it, I think that might be just a, a dolly that was positioned should they need it. No, I think it's a disc chain that's going on, brake, it's a, a disc and pad change that's going on. As we look down there in the pit lane with, by the look of things, Alessio Rivera about to jump back on board the Ferrari. Yeah, so this Ferrari should come alive again once more now. So that is the number 25 car of uh, Giorgio Senegiotto that's back in. He did a good old stint as well at Giorgio Senegiotto at the wheel of the number 25 car. But let's put the gun hand back in again, which is Alessio Rivera for another stint at the wheel of the number 25 car. Axel Jeffries has also come into the pit lane at the wheel of the 26 Ferrari. We've also got the number 33 Matteo Carioli car back in as well. I didn't think he'd been out in the car for too long. So the pit lane filling up. And largely, this is because they haven't quite ticked off as yet the requisite number of pit stops. And they've only got, what, about 40? 50 minutes now in which to do so. The 26 has to do that five second stationary additional because of that track limit infringement, and that looked like a painstakingly long time for them. I saw, I think it's Ramos Azami who's going to get behind the wheel of that car. I could see him patiently waiting for that driver's side door to open so that he could get in as well. Of course, he had to wait for the car to be refueled as well as the, the uh, Ferrari that came in before that. I think this is the 51 car that came in earlier. Sorry, the 25 car, excuse me, has now made its way out of the pit lane. Uh, Aliseo Rivera now behind the wheel of that car as the race leader is across the line. Mario Engel now behind the wheel. And, uh, well, Dries Van Tor was uh, a couple of tenths of a second faster last time around. He was seven tenths of a second faster on the previous lap. And, well, he's, he's gone quicker again. And this time he's gone close to eight tenths of a second faster uh, than our race leader. I think we're going to have a great battle here between the 99 and 46 as the 93 is released. And, of course, the brakes have been changed on that car. The... Uh, 26 car has also been released. Aramis Azami is indeed behind the wheel of that car. I think he'll do one final stint and then hand over possibly back to uh, uh, Omar Jackson, who will take the wheel at the, for the end of the race. As we fast, fast approach the final two hours here at the Lenovo Golf, 12 hours at the Yas Marina circuit. Uh, the final round as well, of course, for the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli, which of course are top three, all contending for uh, that position because all three of them there in that class and all three in pro. 
Uh, Jules Goudon has got a task on here. He runs in third place overall with the number 14 Mercedes. But as you could see on the shot a few moments ago, not that far behind him is the overall race leader, Mauro Engel. So the two Mercedes drivers at it at a similar part of the circuit. And well, for Jules Goudon, his task is absolutely to stay on the lead lap of the race because Mauro Engel is only about a second, couple of seconds behind him at this stage. So he's going to have to push on. The work still continues in the pit lane. This is the number 61 Ferrari that Miguel Ramos brought in towards the pit lane. Uh, he is running down in 19th position currently. The car hasn't quite had the run that they had wanted. And we've also now got, by the look of things, some a little bit more damage to the tail end of the Gosler car. I can see a little bit more bodywork just flapping around there, I thought, as it went down the straight. It was on the same side as there were concern over the damage earlier on, but there was just something flapping around on what would be the right-hand side of the MP Racing Mercedes. So out of the pit lane goes the number 61 car, so brought into the pit lane by Miguel Ramos. Now, who's going to get back behind the wheel of it? Could it be Con Conrad Grunveld? Who, yes, I would be the driver that I would expect to get behind the wheel of that one. So Conrad Grunveld does indeed jump back behind the wheel of the number 61 car. That should now go well again. And, well, we've got two team managers being summoned to the stewards' office, car 32 and 7 uh, for repeated track uh, limit infringements. That's the fourth one, I think, for both of those team managers. So they'll have to go across. And what we've seen in the past, they will most likely incur a penalty. And I think that's another penalty for the Herbert Motorsport car as well. They They've had a few. They have certainly had a few over the course of... Uh, the uh, almost close now to 10 hours of racing that we've had here at the Lenovo Golf. 12 hours here at the Yas Marina circuit. Haas RT have moved their way back up into the top 10. Racing 1 dropped down as is the 33 of Herbert's Motorsport, but of course Racing 1 are in the pit lane. Uh, AF Corsa 61, as uh, Mark said, he's gone out of the pit lane, but into the pit lane there comes the 88, the Garage 59 car of uh, Alexander West. I think this might be a driver change. Is there a driver ready? Marvin yes, Kirkhofer, I would have thought you'd prop into it now. Louis Perret's done a good chunk of driving. Alexander West has now ticked off the four hours and 20 minutes as a bronze driver in that Pro-Am combination that he needs to do. And you would have thought Marvin Kirkhofer would be the man that would get behind the wheel of that car now for the final stint of it. So uh, uh, Chris is leaving the commentary box. Chris. Milbourne and David Addison will jump back in very very shortly whilst the pit stop goes on for the number 88 garage 59 car so how is Jules Gounon getting on pulling away from Mauro Engel because he was only just on the lead lap of the race well uh, Jules Gounon will be heading over the start finish line any second now and as the number 14 car goes through now a split second later goes through Mauro Engel so he's only just still on the lead lap there's what probably two seconds between the pair of them so Jules Gounon will just have to keep pressing on he'll be hoping for clear traffic he'll be hoping if he does meet traffic it's kind to him because their sole focus will be remaining on the lead lap of the race keeping their fingers crossed that there might be a late safety car as well remember the top three still have one more imposed pit stop to do they've all done nine of the requisite number of ten and they have now with literally just over two hours to go only got 45 minutes before they need to come into the pits as does everybody else and ensure that you get the 10 imposed pit stops in in the first 11 and a quarter hours of the race so number 99 Maro Angle leads the way second is 46 Dries Van Tor third is number 14 Jules Goon on a fourth is the leading Pro-Am car which is number 27 Ollie Milroy in fifth place it is 77 Frank Bird sixth place is the leading Am car which is the number 21 car in the hands of Justin Blattner seventh is 75 Philip Ellis, 8th is number 11 Scott Andrews, Ninth is 7 which is Ralph Bone, but that car remember has an extra 5 seconds to spend when it comes into the pit lane next time through, more penalties than anybody else, and completing the top 10, is the Audi once more, back inside the top 10 on pit um, strategy and um, rotation at the moment, so the number 2 car which is a hand in the hands of Greg Goulvert, so uh, that's the order as we now enter the final 2 hours of this 12th, run 12th running of the Lenovo Gulf 12 hours. The pit lane for the first time in a while is empty. David Addison rejoins me in commentary. And it's all still very Mercedes, isn't it? With Dries Van Thor chasing hard, but 11.3 seconds to try to make up with this pedal box uh, issue uh, in the car. It's down to him to try and make the best of it now as the marginally shorter stature driver. Valentino Rossi busy making more friends in the pit garage, but with his uh, Overalls off and uh, uniform on. I think he's probably done for the day, isn't he now? Yeah, absolutely. I'd uh, say as Alan was was uh, suggesting whilst you were having your having your break, um, there's an issue with the pedal box on that car, and Valentino was allegedly uh, 
due to go back in and have another stint in it, but the pedal box is broken in the position that suits Dries van Thor and not in the position that either suits Nick Yellily and, and uh, Valentino Rossi. So for, for, for obvious reasons, the teams have changed the strategy, double stint uh, Dries, because he's the driver that's going to be comfortable. Or less uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, yes, quite. as the case may be. Uh, so let's see what he can do. Uh, and of course, Jules going on in third place. Well, he can sit there because he's going to win the championship from there. So from the race point of view, we'd like to see him push on. But it depends really what he's being told by the team. Because yeah. if he wants to win the championship, he can just sit tight in third place and back the points, can't he? And it's another title to add to a very impressive CV. Yeah, indeed. With uh, multiple Bathurst, was it three now? Bathurst 12 three, hour wins, yeah, two yeah. Spa 24s, Fanatec GT. World Challenge Europe Endurance Cup and the overall championship. Uh, class wins in America and titles in America. Yeah, has he, has, did, he hasn't run, has, did he win Daytona yet? He won his class at Daytona. Daytona, yeah. In the yeah. GTD class. GTD class, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's, another stellar season. If you ever want to buy him a Christmas present, a trophy cabinet's a good idea, isn't it? It's a big one, <laughs> very big one, yeah. No wonder he moved to Andorra. I mean, probably <laughs> cheaper building works out there, uh, build the extension to the house. So, uh, yeah, Jules Gounard, as I say, running third. Now, Ollie Milroy fourth, Frank Bird fifth, uh, and then Dustin Blattner has taken back number 21. Joel Sturm has driven that car, hasn't he? But not much, surely. He has, but not much again, no, yeah. Very yeah. odd. But it's they've, they've, uh, well, I know that AMS have got to do, is it, nine hours and a bit, but uh, it doesn't really give Joel Sturm with a great deal to do, but he was very useful in qualifying to get the car up from 40 into the grid. Uh, so that runs sixth and then seventh, Philip Ellis has just gone over the stripe in number 75 Mercedes with the American-based Australian Scott Andrews having brought that car, number 11 Ferrari, into the pit lane. So that pit stop cycle is through. And two hours to go, but what have we got really uh, of, of the available time left for the regulation pit stops. Giorgio Roda. It's got to be factored in pretty rapidly as well. David Fuminelli's got back in the number 11 car. I thought they might go for Giorgio Roda, which David Fuminelli, who wasn't that long ago in the car, so he's probably not been out of it for much longer than an hour, which is the minimum period you could be out of the car before you get back in again. But he's pushed back in to the driving seat with uh, an hour and 57 minutes just under of the race to go. Quick look at what's going on at turn number one. That's the number three car, which is now in the hands of Al Faisal Al Zubair, back in for his final stint. Leaving the pit lane goes the number seven Herbeth Motorsport car. That would have had to have served an extra five seconds over the course of this pit stop. It was brought into the pit lane in the hands of Ralph Bone, and it leaves the pit lane, allegedly still in the hands of the same driver. So for Mario Engel, He's on lap 287, and the lead gap 11.4 seconds. He was, again, a little bit quicker than Dries van Thor last time. So it's all looking good for Mercedes, isn't it, in terms of the manufacturer points. It's looking good for a Mercedes driver in Jules Gounon for the championship. And if uh, you want to sort of share this around, one Mercedes driver for the title and another crew for the race win, really. So uh, Group M looking as though they're exorcising those demons of last year and, and, and sort of coming back in style. And in terms of the potentials for the Independence Cup. We know where that's likely to be going in the hands of Jonathan Hoy, but the Manufacturers' Cup, the way things are at the moment, David? Mercedes. I, Mercedes, AG, yeah. who will overtake BMW, who came into this weekend with a nine-point advantage. Looks like it. So, for the current state, Mauro Engel ticking off the laps. Now, where's the next battle going to come from, though? Because 11 and a half seconds, first and second is one fight. What about Frank Bird catching Ollie Milroy before the end? difficult because their lap time is pretty comparable at the moment aren't they? Uh, very much so yeah just uh, what's that going to be um, uh, half a second or sorry uh, five one hundredths of a second between the pair of them and there is Frank Bird now just about to turn his way round through turn number 16 he's got uh, a back marker car that he wants to try and feed his way through which is Al Faisal Al Zubair so the two Mercedes thunder their way down the start finish line and up towards turn one and in the pit lane still is Alan Hyde. Yeah and the Optimum Motorsport car has come in so this is my opportunity uh, to have a chat with uh, Ollie Milroy so I'm making my way up to the exit end of pit lane. That was pretty much maximum stint for Ollie Milroy wasn't it? Yeah, wasn't I think a bit so. there or there I thought so else. yeah pretty much. Uh, we've also got yet another drama for WRT. Philip Eng's car being given a, a number 32 BMW given a five second penalty on the next pit stop for track limits. 
it's a kick a car when it's down kind of thing. It's in 17th place anyway, and seven laps behind, but uh, it was never going to come back from there. As into the pit lane comes now the Dustin Blatt and the car collection motorsport Porsche. You're looking at Oli Milroy's McLaren being refueled, and it's about to be reshod. But maybe finally we can talk about Joel Sturm in 21 Porsche as the car pits. <laughs> it's about time, isn't it? He's yeah. been waiting very patiently all day. It's like waiting for a, for a delivery from one of the poor delivery companies, isn't it? You're waiting all day and it might arrive, it might not, but it has arrived in the pit lane for him. So we'll have a, a big old smile on his face now. And they can afford to take their time with this pit stop because they are three laps ahead in yeah. terms of Am at the moment. So, Alan, what news from the pit lane? Yeah, no, when I walked past him in the pit lane, he was smiling. He <laughs> sort of gave me a little wave. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wanted somebody to talk to. He's had well, so yeah. little to do all day. I, 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 do, I do best with people with helmets on, to be perfectly honest. It's uh, the sort of conversation I understand these days. Right, so new tyres for the 21 Porsche, as it would be a full service. Sticker tyres, tank fuel, uh, new driver gets on board. Also, the Audi is in, number two, uh, which has got back up the order, hasn't it? Greg Gilbert brought the car in in eighth place. So in its yo-yo day, it's had another uh, good stint. And the Haas Racing Team car back up the order. And it's a shame we don't see more of Greg Gilbert in GT3 cars, but he's delivered. Into also has come 77, uh, Frank Bird. This is going to be a ninth pit stop for that car now, so that puts it back on track with the top three overall. Yeah, and so that's what the cars in at fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth that have all sort of pitted more recently. Back out of the pit lane goes car number 21. We'll wait for the driver name to change and a big cheer will go up if it does say Joel Sturm. And it Yay. does, yeah. So finally, Joel Sturm gets the opportunity to jump on board the number 21 car. You said you thought you might have seen him out earlier on. I thought he did one stint, one stint. early on when they, they gave everybody one crap behind the wheel and then concentrated on uh, Dressler and, and Blattner to get their drive time. And yeah. now, hopefully, they'll keep Joel Sturm in it. Uh, he's had a very leisurely day. He's been to the pool, probably. <laughs> Had a massage. Absolutely, yeah. and then finally he's got a bit of work to do. Baro Engel in the meantime has just put another lap on 77 as it sits in the pit lane. So uh, Engel in 99 looking a bit dominant up front. And especially if the chasing car has a problem, uh, the gap, well, believe it or not, came down by hundreds last time. Uh, 11.2 seconds Engel to Van Thor, but uh, it's a bit cat and mouse between those two. That said, we're still uh, over an hour and 50 minutes to go, so. Uh, the Gripper M can't relax yet, can they? No, not at all. In terms of uh, yeah, some GT races, you're probably only what eight or nine minutes into a into a race for a two-hour one. But yeah, we are a long, long way into this one. But still a long, long, long way to go. Alan Hyde, hopefully, has either got news or has found somebody to chat to. It's unfair when someone has done a mega stint at the wheel of a car to then uh, demand that he has a chat to me. But um, Ollie and I have known each other for a long time now, and. You're sort of used to me being annoying, aren't you? Yeah, you're always there. <laughs> Back in the Formula Renault days, first person we spoke to, whether the right, whether it was a good race or a bad race. So, yeah, it's always great to see it's you. It's a learning process. It takes you all the way through the career. But today, it's a, a success story because things are going brilliantly for you, lot. Commentator's curse. No, don't, no, don't, no, no, no one else can hear. So far, so far, so good. Um, yeah, we couldn't have asked for a better car, better race so far. Um, we're just now kind of nursing it obviously the pressure's still on the the mercedes i think that's in p2 is still it's still fast and they're trying to hunt us down so we can't cruise too much but obviously now it's all about taking no risk with traffic um looking after the brakes looking after everything really the car the power steering the whole lot so and just making sure we get to the end with no no issues but still a long way to go that was a long stint wasn't it yeah i did it i did a double so i did two hours in the car um which is great. I mean, look, when you're leading, it's the best place to be, isn't it? <laughs> so, so I enjoyed it. Um, and the car feels awesome. The guys at Optimum Motorsport have done a mega job of setting the car up this week. It's, it's really dialed in. And, and we knew we were maybe lacking a bit of performance in qualifying, but we knew that we had a, a mega strong race car. So, yeah, it's great. It's, it's, at the moment, it's working out. You're used to the heat in this part of the world now, aren't you? Yeah, I was actually near the end of that second hour then, I was like, Cool, right, this is where all the cycling in the desert summer pays off, you know, dealing with the heat. Um, and I can genuinely feel it, you know, you do acclimatise, especially when you're training, I've been training flat where are, you, where are you living in Dubai? Yeah, living in Dubai, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, it's, it definitely pays off when you're in the car 
boiling, boiling hot, but, but yeah, so uh, we're loving it out here. I was going to send you um, a little message the other week because through um, circumstance, I, I ended up, would you believe, in your old office. Oh, wow, OK, with the guys at Driven, was that? Dri Driven International yeah. that had a part, of, I think, in the um, design of this circuit, the redesign of this circuit. Yeah, every time I come here, they message me and ask me what I think of the layout. Oh, do guys, they really? <laughs> we've, we've, so I've seen the computer animation and everything yeah. to do with it. And that was where you operated your business from, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. My wife and I uh, have, have a, still have an office there in the UK, but uh, she's set up another office here in Dubai now as well. So, um, yeah, but those guys, the guys have done an awesome job with the layout here. You know, I'm sure every driver down the pit lane will agree that the new turn nine is a great corner. Um, the hairpin onto the back straight, turn five, gives a, some great op overtaking opportunities. It's, it's a really mega circuit, and it's, it's great it's only an hour from my house now. Uh, they're, they're really cool people, actually, because the challenge that we gave them, we do a podcast, a motorsport podcast, and um, uh, we had some great guests, some great drivers on over the course of this year, and we asked them all to pick their favourite corner from any circuit in the world. And, and driven have put it into a circuit that you can drive on a simulator. It's amazing. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I'd love to get that go. And then we need to speak to them and have a go on it because we're looking for some drivers to set a good time. Yeah, and then maybe I, I wouldn't put it, put it past Dubai or Abu Dhabi to then build it for real. Yeah, <laughs> I, I rather like the idea of that. <laughs> if I was to ask you to pick one corner from any circuit anywhere in the world, what would it be? Wow. I, uh, wow. Wow, what a question. I think, I mean, uh, Eau Rouge and Radion is incredible in a GT3 car because it's just about flat out in qualifying. It's sometimes flat out in the race. You know, it's a mega corner in GT3. I also like Puan as well, the double left at Spa. Um, I, I mean, if you're talking about corners, I think you've got to, got to look at Spa for those. I need to get you together with the people at Driven. I feel a circuit number two coming on. That sounds like a great plan, yeah. <laughs> with turn nine from Abu Dhabi as well. <laughs> now. Hey, Ollie, I'll let you take a drink now. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thanks, Alan. There Thank we you. go. Ollie Milroy down here in the pit lane. Really cool. Does a two-hour stint. Quite happy to, to talk about all sorts of nonsense down in the pit lane. <laughs> oh, he's been taught well. Uh, so <laughs> the car that he has just got out of, he's given over to Rob Bell, uh, and it is in four place and as he was saying they're leading in pro-am from number 75 the mercedes in p2 uh, is the philip ellis driven kenny hubble started martin conrad dominic bauman car uh, as 99 for gripper air mario engel accelerates then up towards the wall at turn 14 inches away millimeters away as he has been throughout the stint the gap 11 seconds then because again last time fractionally slower that the BMW is about to come up and break the beam. But uh, again, now, it doesn't matter whether Mario Engel wins by a minute, a second, a thousandth, as long as he wins. So he can just afford to drive at a pace that's going to keep him ahead. And, and they've wor worked abs absolutely to their own script, haven't they? They yeah. had, at the start of this race, they positioned themselves very differently to every other car that was out there, which meant that they were running down in 20th position for a, a good period of the race in the early stages and would climb as high as 15th before they pit again and go the way back down there. But we always knew the race was going to head in their direction. It's probably got there sooner than I expected, in all honesty, because they've been in the lead for a good period of time now. What, an hour and a half nearly in the lead of the race now? And have still got an hour and a quarter to go. They know that they only have to tick off one further imposed pit stop. They also know, and that's the important part, that they're respective competitors who are both on the lead lap as well with them. Team WRT, the number 46 car in the hands of Dries Van Thor, and the number 14 AMG Mercedes 2C's entrant in the hands of Jules Goudon. They also have to tick off one more pit stop. So it's a level playing field, what we're seeing out there at the moment. As long as no cars have any problems and we have any further safety cars or anything, then we're at a level playing field. And we've now only got another 50, uh, sorry, another uh, one hour for them to come in and conduct that final pit stop because 45 minutes to go is when all of those imposed pit stops have to be completed. So, uh, for the next fight, as I say, we've got Pro Am to look at. And what about Am, where Joel Sturm is away up the road, not only by a number of places, but by a couple of laps as well. So, Am looks like it's been absolutely dominated, doesn't it, by car collection motorsport Porsche that might be the kiss of death as well as you see all sorts of drama going on at turn six and seven as cars skip off the road uh, in the midst of all of that Matteo Cairoli in number 33 the white Porsche we've not seen enough of Cairoli all day have we but uh, right stand to attention now because we know that car is going to be very rapid indeed in his hands he is yeah he just eases his way past Ramiz Asman then 
at the wheel of the Revel and Carrera backed uh, Ferrari 296. The next car that he will look to see what he might be able to catch up with will be for position as well. And that was why he was keen to get past that Ferrari because that was not for position. That Ferrari is running ahead of it actually, so he's overtaken a car that's running ahead of him. But for David Carioli now, the sorry, Matteo Carioli now, the next car that he needs to catch is going to be David Buminelli, who at the wheel of the number 11 Kessel Racing Ferrari is literally just up the road now, so they'll head around through turn number 15 up towards turn number 16 any second and here they both come that's the relative gap between the pair of them for what is the final two places inside the top 10 so ninth and 10th over the start finish line absolutely together Rob Bell is menacingly looming in the background as well at the wheel of the number 27 Optimum Motorsport car the car that he has only just taken over from the man we've just spoken to Ollie Milroy down there in the pit lane with Alan Hyde a few moments ago and that car is comfortably leading Pro-Am. It is on lap number 192 at the moment. On lap number 191 is second in Pro-Am, which is the Sun Energy car of Philip Ellis. Third in Pro-Am is on lap number 190. So there's a lap between each one of them, first, second and third in Pro-Am at this stage. So the car that's leading by the largest margin, what's it, three laps is it? Did I count up that the AM-class car is leading? I think that's right, yep. yeah. Uh, and, and that's without your gun driver having done very much towards it. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah Dressler and... Uh, who's the second driver? Antara's out. Antara's out. No, Justin Blackman. Sorry, the second driver in oh, 21. Uh, they've done a tremendous job, especially given that they're not you know, regulars in GT3 machinery at this level. I mean, they've had a, a very, very good uh, effort put in there between those two. Yeah, they certainly have, haven't they? And the car has just run faultlessly. You, know, you, you look at how quickly it worked its way up into contention as well. It was a leading qualifier in the AM category, so it started ninth on the grid. The next AM class car was in 12th position on the grid. Of course, that grid was based on the average lap times across all of the drivers that qualified the car. And in terms of average lap times, they were about half a second quicker average lap time. So, yeah, you could argue that they qualifying dominant, but. They have just had to keep their nose clean, stay out of trouble. And if I think back through it, David, have you seen any penalties for the 21? If I have, it's probably one, and it was a long time ago. Yeah, nothing instantly strikes. Yeah. Uh, and it might have been a track limit. I mean, it's certainly not been for causing a collision. Yeah. Because they've been keeping out of trouble in that respect. Um, I'm not, I don't remember even talking about a track limit penalty for them. So uh, let's just have a quick look uh, because at the end of the 10th hour of the race the number 21 car had spent 16 minutes and 54 seconds in the pit lane as against 21 minutes and 59 seconds for number 14 Mercedes now okay that did his brake change which may or may not have been necessary uh, and that doesn't necessarily correlate in terms of the number of physical stops but it spent less time stationary in the pit lane. Pit lane, yeah, than one of the pro-class cars. Yeah, and, yeah. and equally some of that is because it's not been racking up penalties. It's not going to five seconds to serve here, it's not going to drive through yeah. there. Yeah, you know? and it all makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what, you know, if you start to rack two, three, four, five or six of those up with a five-second penalty here and a 15-second penalty there, all of a sudden you're a lap, of, a lap adrift of somebody. Yeah, minimum time in the pits is one of the ways you win the race, isn't yeah. it? Uh, right, Matteo Cairoli is another gun and he's about to have a go at uh, David Fuminelli. This is for position, this is for 8th and ninth. this battle. Fuminelli is no mug in the Ferrari. Matteo Cairoli is another absolute star in Porsches, Carrera Cup Italy champion. Uh, he's raced them in GT, he's raced them in ELMS, he's raced them in the WEC. And right now he's crawling all over the back of Fuminelli like a rash, isn't he? As they come underneath the hotel, he's got a tighter line out of turn. 14, but there's also a back marker up the road. It's another Ferrari, and David Fuminelli's got to commit to a line. Cairoli will want to try and uh, take the opportunity here if he can. Gets right onto the tail as they come out of the last corner, up out of turn 16 towards the line. But there, the Ferrari just had slightly better acceleration off the corner, it seemed. Yeah, that was Stefan Lemere, wasn't it? Number 20 Ferrari. And is David Fuminelli going to get through at turn number one? He does. And Stefan Lemere then leaves the door open for Matteo Carioli to work his way through. It's equally as important that it's of a position because it's not just for eighth and ninth. Potentially, it's for the final spot on the podium in the Pro Am class, isn't it? Yeah, Third and fourth in Pro Am. Yeah, and those two cars, also Cairoli is scoring IGTC points. 
so that's going to help Porsche to a degree as well. I know they're not in the overall manufacturer's hunt for the overall title anymore, but uh, Porsche points perhaps to go that way. Right, but Fuminelli, having gained a little bit in the traffic, is uh, in danger of, of losing out completely now because Cairoli, all fired up, goes after him down the back straight towards turn six, turn seven. That chicane effectively hard on the brakes. That's where we lost Stefano Borghi earlier on. The residue from the accident of which he's still there, isn't it? All that speedy drive still down. It certainly is. One car into the pit lane. So from 11th position towards the pit lane comes number 26 car in the hands of Ramez Asma. That's the racing one car. It did seem five minutes ago that that car was in. He'd only done um, a short stint and he's brought the car back in. But that may well be just trying to tick off. And again, another one of those imposed pit stops. Uh, Matteo Cairoli having another little nibble there as it went in towards turn nine on David Fuminelli, but nothing doing there. Is he going to have another go as they head up towards the next uh, fast right-hand kink, which no, he can't. So up towards turn number 12, this is where there's no real now overtaking opportunity until you get towards the start-finish line, really, unless the driver ahead makes a mistake. So they're neat and tidy through there. And problems for the number 26 racing one car. I did say I didn't think it had been out on circuit long since its last pit stop. It's on the dollies, it's being pushed back into the garage, so something clearly was wrong. Indeed so, and this is where the sting in the tail comes, isn't it? You know, you battled on from late morning, lunchtime, all the way through the heat of the afternoon, and now you think, right, we're almost there, you've got 98 minutes to go, and now there are problems. Now the, the rigours of the day and uh, flat-out racing for over 10 hours are starting to bite, and the car's perhaps getting just a little bit frail. Earlier on, it was drivers making mistakes now maybe the uh, wear and tear on the car is starting to take its toll as well yeah and of course for the 296 it's a car that you know is, is still in its infancy as well the teams are still trying to understand it and I was saying to, to Chris Milbourne earlier on all the teams running the 296 for this year are coming to Yasperina with no real data at all you could argue it's the same for the McLarens because of the Evo update was quite a substantive Evo update on the McLaren at the beginning of the year but at least they've got some base data to work from, whereas the cars that were running the 488 last year, you could put that in the bin, because as soon as you get hold of the 296, you have to start from scratch again. Yeah, it's completely different, isn't it? But yeah, some teams have not only got on with the job very well, they've done it successfully. Uh, at perhaps the hardest race of all, Nürburgring 24 hours went to a 296, and that was from a team that's gone from Porsche to Ferrari with very, very little data. So it looks as though all of the front end has been taken off the racing one car, in towards the pit lane comes Karina Gosner, so the MP racing number 73 Mercedes heads down the pit lane, that's another car that's had its few little troubles along the way but this looks as though it is just a standard pit stop for the moment, or is it no, dollies are going underneath again, or we're getting ready to go underneath, and now it looks as though there's further inspection around the brake area, particularly on the right front and the right rear. Again, late in the day, this is when the abuse, if you like, that the cars have had, the, the wear and tear over the race starts to kick in, doesn't it? Uh, and although in some races they've got to go for all over again, another 12 hours, 24 hour races, uh, but at the moment this is a car that's clearly suffering. Yeah, I'd imagine some of the drivers are suffering as well because it's still been a warm day out there. We've got this air conditioned box that we've been in throughout the course of the day, but it's still warm out there on circuit, which is where Alan Hyde is. All I can tell you about the 26 car is they are uh, desperately trying to cool the right front of the car whether okay. they're calling the brakes or something else around there. Um, now they've managed to cool it down. Um, they're about to go to work with power tools to disassemble various parts around the, 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 the brake disc. So other than that, I don't want to get in the way. I don't want to get any closer into the garage. And to be honest, my technical knowledge is so limited. That's uh, pretty much as much as I can tell you anyway. But um, uh, uh, that's going to be in the garage for a little while, I've got a feeling. Yeah, because as Mark pointed out, they've taken a huge amount of the, the bodywork off that car. There is debris on the track at turn three to turn four. Now, there's no yellow flag suggesting a car is off, but there is debris on the road. And Cairoli then absolutely on the tail of Fuminelli under braking for the chicane there. Goes left, goes right. The Ferrari again gets the power down just a little bit better coming up the other side of the corner. The continuation of that back part of the circuit now takes them down towards turn nine. And Cairoli is close, but he's not really close enough to have a go. Or is he? Thinks about it, fakes the inside. And yes, he is. Dives up the inside, stands on the anchors, gets up the inside and takes the line for the corner, but doesn't run too wide, doesn't leave the door open. Job done. Nicely done as well. We know those Porsches have been quick in a straight line all day, but that took some doing still from De uh, Matteo Cairoli to work his way through past David Fuminelli, who is 
Well, certainly not the easiest person to pass, but that was absolutely textbook, was it not? There is the debris, that one would imagine, that's been picked up between turn three and turn four, and it doesn't look as though it's that far off the racing line, but it doesn't look like carbon fibre from there. It looks more like a, a wheel arch insert or something like that, does it not? Could well be, couldn't it? Uh, so it's, it's, again, wear and tear, you could yeah. argue, rather than contact between cars. Yep, so now that Cairoli has worked his way through past David Fuminelli, already the number 33 car is pulling away, so that was the change for eighth position, but more importantly, that was the change for the last step on the podium in Pro-Am, with just over an hour and a half to go. It's the number 33 Porsche that now occupies third place in Pro-Am, and potentially off the Pro-Am podium is the number 11 car. Now, I suspect both of these have still got one further pit stop to do, and if they have played their cards right David as a cynic if you've still yeah. got a joker pit stop up your sleeve the final pit stop will be the one to just make sure you're maybe a little bit shorter than you ought to be uh, yeah I mean you could do it um, it depends on your situation doesn't it because yeah. you, you've only got a second to play with it's and, not much and, and it's not much but you know, if, if the battle is that close you would but you know if you're 30 seconds adrift not really much point risking it. Yeah, I mean, the point was is that if uh, David Fuminelli can sit on the back of Matteo Cairoli yeah. and they both come into the pit lane at the same time and one's got a joker pit stop up their sleeve and the other one hasn't. Absol back ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's worth a fill, certainly. Uh, and we'll see what Kessel can do. And, you know, Herbert and Kessel, both very experienced teams, so um, no doubt factored this in. We're checking their pit stop data, seeing whether they've got that joker available to them. Uh, Mario Engel, in the meantime, is now turning in a masterclass, isn't he, of how to drive a Mercedes, because he's not really under any pressure from Dries Van Thorpe. The gap is down to under 10 seconds now, uh, whereas it's really more for Van Thorpe to worry about, because he has now been reported to the stewards for a fourth track limit offence. Right, so he needs to be careful. Absolutely. So uh, Van Thorpe chasing, but uh, might be suffering in due course because of these track limit abuses. Uh, Myro Engel is, is one of those really annoying individuals, isn't he? Because um, he's, he's not a bad-looking guy at all. Um, he's a very good racing driver, but he's a genuinely nice and a funny man at the same time as well. And speaks impeccable English. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, with, yeah. his, with his fantastic Aussie twang <laughs> that he picked up while he was in supercars. Yeah, yeah. Funny, very annoying. <laughs> and in fairness, he's one of the only drivers in the pit lane still talking to me, so... <laughs> Happy days after nearly 11 hours. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, We're still talking right, to you. You don't need to agree so readily. <laughs> we're still talking to you, Alan. I know, you're but, my friends. But that will all end in an hour and a half, rest assured. Uh, it will it'll end, end in about half an hour, because I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm vacating the pit lane. <laughs> Time for his nap. <laughs> yes, yes uh, Chris Milbourne will be taking over down in the pit lane for the final hour of the race, whilst Alan prepares for what will be the podiums, not just for the Lenovo Golf 12 hours, but also for the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli. And also, do they have the championship podiums here this evening, David? Possibly. Yes. I've never stayed that long. Right. <laughs> but Alan, yes. Alan will tell us at midnight. Yes. Yes. You've got a lot of podiums to get through, Alan, and you've got a flight to catch, David. Yes, I shall not be hanging around for all of the cheering. I shall pass on my congratulations to people electronically. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, I bet I'm not the only person from the event on the, on the plane, either. So Dries Van Thor goes through. Alan, um, yeah. I think there's something like um, nine or ten podiums that we'll conduct, so uh, we'll be here for a little while. Look, um, compared to the SRO Awards night, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, trust it's a very, me, trust it's a me. Very, it's a very good point. That, that's because they give out awards to anybody, Alan, don't they? <laughs> and, uh, the, 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 oh, yeah. Oh, no, I see what you've done there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, we should have introduced you this morning as award-winning commentator. David Addison joins me in the pit lane. Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, but on a serious note, can I just say, very well deserved, David. It took you 20 years to get one. It's taken me 30 and I've had nothing. <laughs> it was my lifetime underachievement award, Alan. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you to SRO for their generosity and desperation. Uh, so uh, yeah, but it, and it was handed to you by John Watson, your co-commentator, <laughs> and that, that's so lovely. I mean, just, it, joking apart, brilliant, well deserved, and crack on with the commentary. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, it was quite nice that Watson was there to to, to do it. Uh, right, what do we read into this uh, Van Thor track limit worry uh, then? Well, there is. Uh, penalties coming for the Audi and also for number 25 Ferrari, but 
not yet anything further heading in the direction of Vanthor, but uh, how many of those transgressions, Mark, you could put down to enthusiasm on Vanthor's part, or the fact that he's not 100% comfortable in the car and therefore isn't able to drive it quite as he wants? Up to discussion. Yeah, very much so up for discussion, because in terms of what Dries Van Tor can achieve out of this race. Well, at the moment, it doesn't look as though the manufacturer's site is going to go the way of BMW. In terms of the uh, Intercontinental GT Challenge, well, the way things stand at the moment, um, yes, if he could catch uh, uh, Maro Engel and get past him, that will give an extra few points to BMW, but it's not going to affect really the fact that the overall driver's title is going to head in the direction of Jules Gounon. It can only be for overall glory and wanting that race win. So. 8.8 seconds, he is closing, he was another uh, two tenths of a second quicker than Myra Lengo, Myra Engel last time through, so I think he's just simply trying to drive the wheel off the thing and go for the win. See what he can do, I mean really that's why he is in that car, drive flat out, get the best result possible for BMW, uh, and in fairness he is chipping away, but he, can, he can see Engel up the road, as he went down the back straight there, just ahead you could see Engel go left into turn six, and that gap is down to 8.8 .8 seconds. But I still think, try as he will, Van Thor is going to ring the neck of that car, yes. But Engel is keeping something in reserve. If he needs to, to turn the wick up, he can. Yeah, I tend to agree. We've still got, of course, Julgoon on remaining on the lead lap. And a five-second penalty for Dries Van Thor on the next pit stop for track limits. So number 46 BMW cops a five-second time penalty on the next stop. That answers that. That answers that one, doesn't it? That absolutely uh, puts a, uh, a full stop underneath that one. So for Dries Van Thorpe, he's pushed a little bit too hard. The totting up procedure, he might not have done that many off-track limits. They may all have been totted up previously by either the likes of Valentino Rossi or Nick Yellowly, but add another one to the tally, you get to the maximum number. And that's the penalty. So that's going to undo the hard work, isn't it? By the time they've all served their final pit stop now, which is going to be in the next uh, 45 minutes, just under, then the gap is going to go out from what was 8.8 .8 seconds up to probably nearer 12 or 15 if, if they continue at a similar pace to each other. Uh, what they could do with is a late race safety car to bring them back into the game. Couldn't they? It's around the outside in the traffic goes number 32 BMW then, which is now got Philip Eng back at the wheel of it, he just sorts out the Audi on the outside line there, the Audi is, is a, another lap up, so that's Xavier Knauf losing track position but not a place in the order. Uh, the reason he was pushing, uh, if, if Dries Van Tor had have managed to get past Maro Angle, BMW would win the Manufacturers Championship right. is the information that I've just received, so and yeah. It could yet happen. Could they, yet happen, could, yeah. could be a drama for the for yep. Ripper M. So that that, that answers also the reason why I was pushing so hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll continue so to do. All right, you're going to lose five seconds, but that's not to say that even on that next pit stop, Grupper M, you know, they, they, there's no guarantee they are bang on a minute and 40. Yeah. You know, something could go wrong. They could be a little bit hesitant releasing the car. A couple of seconds lost. You know, five seconds, is, yes, of course, it's a time loss, and it's tough to recover that. But with a pit stop for both cars, it's possible that some of that could be could be made back up. Matteo Cairoli is done for the moment. Tim Heinemann to finish the race in that car by the look of it. Which is not a bad driver to have in for the tail end of the race, is it? No. So we've got 86 minutes and it might be they still split that in terms of drive time. We'll see. Matteo Cairoli, as expected, has done wonderful things in that car. And if he is leaving Portra at the end of this year, the, the rumour is he's off to Lamborghini, uh, then uh, he could be very proud of what he's achieved for the Weissach mark. It was um, quite superb at Macau. Uh, uh, it, it, he was quite superb until the main race, when he found the, the wall race, quite yeah. early on. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. He was, his was the Singtao beer-backed Porsche, wasn't it? That's right, top the times after day one. Yeah. I think it was uh, there or thereabouts on day two as well. So just just hugely impressive with pace. Um, bearing in mind, um, I don't think he'd been there before, had he? No, that's right. I mean, generally, Porsche had a pretty horrible time for pace in Macau, didn't they? But the likes of Cairoli and uh, uh, Lawrence Van Thor did stand out. I might see if I can just get a very, very quick uh, update from 
Nick Yellowly. Um, okay. uh, we spoke to him after he got out of the car just to ask how his leg was. How's the leg now? Is it recovering? Yeah, yeah, I'll be fine by tomorrow. Just like um, I felt like I'd done way too many squats. So <laughs> just a bit, yeah, a bit wobbly. So you'll have a terribly powerful left leg tomorrow and the and the right. So you'll be walking with a limp, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, for now, it's it's like that, but it's fine. It's not it's not ultra painful. The, the problem was more when I was in the car, it was cramping under braking. So then to control the brake pedal was really difficult. So I managed to get to lap 11 with no issues. And then from there, it was yeah, just a bit of a fight. I didn't want to talk to you for too long earlier on, but um, I, I take it that Valentino was having the same problem before you. I think there was some issue, yes. Um, not exactly sure. I haven't really spoken to him about that particular yeah. problem yet. Um, but yeah, I think that was a bit of a confusion in the pit stop in general. Um, but I, I didn't know till I got in and tried to, to yank the pedals and unfortunately it didn't move. So uh, I, I presume the lever broke and then you can't, can't adjust them. So unfortunate, but it's what it is. Okay, well, you're a star. We knew that anyway, but amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Um, yeah, so um, he's not comfy. You can see the way he's holding his leg. He's not comfy, but um, you wouldn't have known it from the lap times. No, very true. Um, when he assuming he does get out of the car. A, a, a Rob Bell moment, have we heard from Rob Bell in the race? We haven't heard from Rob Bell. No. Uh, that will tick off all three of the drivers in the Optimum car. You may um, you may not get it, because he might stay into the very end, really. But uh, uh, That's possible, yeah. Just in case. Yeah, a uh, uh, very good call indeed. Yeah, I think looking, trying to remember back through what the drivers didn't swear, I think Rob Bell highly likely to stay until mm. the end. So I think yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we know that Mark Radcliffe has done the four that he needed to do. Ollie Milroy's had uh, a good share of the driving and Rob Bell has done less than anybody. So yeah, Rob Bell stick him in for the last part of the race. Looks like there's another bit of debris there, doesn't it? At the exit of turn number five as into the pit lane comes number 20, Stefan Lemeray at the wheel of the AF Corsa Ferrari that's running fifth in the AM category in towards the pit lane for what looks as though that will tick off one further pit stop for that car. Um, we've also got another one of the AF Corsa cars, which is currently in 18th place in the hands of Mikael Grunweg, running sixth in AM. That has also picked up because of track limits an additional five second time penalty at the next pit stop. Yeah, Conrad Grunweg, another best reporter enthusiast. Stefan Lemere, one of those people that just gets to drive everywhere, anywhere. In any Same amount of Porsches for sure, haven't they, in the past? Well, he's a, uh, by trade, Belgian motorsport journalist, so lots of things that he's ever raced were all sort of magazine articles or track tests. Uh, but because he's done a lot of di different racing, he's a very accomplished driver, but still graded bronze. So now he's in demand, you see. So he does GT4s in things like Toyotas. There's some of the debris it's out of number seven Porsche. Uh, but yeah, he would have raced Porsches. He's raced lots of GT4 machinery and uh, you know, GT3 Ferraris. And, and, uh, you name it, really. So Stefan has driven it. Hard work, isn't it? Tough life. Yeah. First world problems and all that. Indeed so, yes. Uh, how's number three Mercedes that you're looking at the back of getting on? Now, Faisal Al uh, at the wheel of it. Ninth, that car is. Interesting hearing Ian Loggie's travails earlier on about his, his boots binding to the pedals. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about pickup, but then we're talking about yep. it underneath wheel arches and around brakes and things. Didn't think about it on, on driver's boots. But it does look as though, you know, two Cs at the moment, um, potentially if they have a, a, the rub of the green for the next hour and 20 minutes, they will get both of their cars on podiums. One, will, of course, will be on the pro podium, potentially in third place, and they'll also get second place in the AM category. Quite so, as Mauro Engel exits term five. There in the AF Corsa camp, more of the screens are studied. Uh, the messages you can see on one page, the pit stop times, the overall classification, and tomorrow angle to the outside line of the surviving Gulf livery McLaren. Marvin Kirchhofer's car, that is. That now in 14th place, and a combination of factors really has, has fallen. Uh, caused that car to fall down the order. Given that, it was leading within that slightly quirky first hour. Yeah, I mean, uh, what really didn't help was the contact, was it, when Martin Kirchhoff was behind the wheel earlier on with one of the Ferraris out there, which punctured a tyre on that car, and he had to limp a long way round the circuit, didn't he, because that tyre was punctured. Was it not at turn three, turn four, where the, the contact occurred between the two of them? I was going to say the approach of five, but yeah, yeah I mean, it's yeah, the same in yeah. the woods, isn't it? But that's, the, that's a good two and a half kilometres to limp the car round on three decent tyres, uh, and that would have cost him a chunk of time. But there have been other issues with that car, with a few um, uh, track limits problems Correct. as well, where it's been yeah. penalties. Time penalties at the start, yeah. yeah. Maybe Jean-Claude Sada in the Ferrari that made contact, but uh, Marvin Kirchhoff uh, flies, we know that. But uh, that car then in 14th place. 
And of course, there's a limited amount that he can contribute there with it being a pro-am car. The lower grade drivers have to tick their drive time boxes. Well, that was the problem whilst you were having your break. Chris was saying they're not doing a driver change, they're leaving Alexander West in. And that would have been because he hadn't done four yeah. hours and 20 minutes as the bronze, because that's a pro-am car with a platinum, a silver, and Alexander West as the bronze. So they, they have no choice. They've, no. they've got to get him to minimum drive time. Uh, and that was what Mark Radcliffe was saying about his car, wasn't it? That he had his full stints to do and he could get those out of the way as soon as, allowing for the break between the yep. stint. Uh, and then, and then give the lion's share of the work later on in the day uh, when you need them to the pros, to the quick drivers, or quicker drivers. Obviously, yes, Mark Radcliffe is slow. Uh, you don't have the same problem in pro, and so they can divide that up in a different way. And Gripper M looked like a different squad compared to this time last year. Absolutely, yeah. We were thinking that uh, it was going to be a Mercedes race last year, and the Gripper M fell by the wayside. Well, was it not both of their cars that fell by the wayside very, very early on in the race, wasn't it, 12? 12 months ago here at Yas Marina. Yeah, one came into the race, if you remember, with legacy of Lucas Al's big damage on the Friday, Friday evening. evening yeah. And then the other car lasted a couple of hours longer, but I think by about five hours, both of them were, were pretty much done. Whereas this one, yeah, they've got one car running in first place overall, the other one running in fifth place overall, and therefore will just miss out on overall podium and the pro podium in the hands of uh, Lorenzo Ferrari currently. The sister car to it, the number 99, still leading the way. The lead advantage between himself and Dries Van Tor at the wheel of the BMW, 7.9 seconds. So Dries has slowly chipped away at it once more, but we still know that that BMW in second place has got an extra five seconds to spend in the pit lane for its final imposed pit stop. Against the final imposed pit stop for the unpenalised number 99 Mercedes, but they need another perfect stop. You know, all it takes is for one mechanic to trip up and, and, and time lost there or the car overshoot or not arrive far enough. You know, there are all manner of ways Absolutely. that they could lose five seconds as well. It's angled through the traffic. That's the Gosner Mercedes ahead, isn't it? Which uh, now has who at the wheel of it? It's Corinna Gosner back at the wheel and that's 20th place and in fairness is effectively last but should gain before the end uh, with 26 Ferrari still in this pit box. Yes, it's not gone anywhere for a long period of time, hasn't it, that no. Ferrari? I'm not sure whether Alan might have an update as to what the problem actually is. So we saw all the fronts of the car coming off it, oh, and he car? suggested the 26, Alan. They were expect you, you said they were okay, expecting I'll the right... Back. Thank yep. you. I'll go back. He said he was expecting the right... Was it right-hand front that they've got yep. some concerns with on that car? But Trying uh, to cool it down, I think, Alan. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, one would imagine with, with a, a leaf blower rather than yeah. waving a piece of paper at it or blowing with your mouth. Like that. Uh, Something what, far more technical to, yeah. to call it down. Yeah. And Alan, once you've investigated Ferrari 26, could, oh, I, yes. could I ask you to go to Garage 59? Um, yes, you can, yeah. Excellent. There's no reason, it's just that it's in the opposite direction. It's, uh, well, I, you know, I've worked with you for long enough that I knew that, so I've already <laughs> ticked off Garage 59, nothing is happening. There you go. <laughs> it was worth a try. <laughs> And Alan started being a pit reporter 100 years ago. He was six foot nine. <laughs> bit by bit, we've whittled him down to four foot four. Uh, so Mario Engel <laughs> charges on, and eight seconds to the good. But as I said a few laps back, you just get the feeling that if this ever became a concern, he just ran this up a notch, wouldn't he? Yes. Yeah, I think he, he's driving with something in reserve. They've got themselves into the position that they've had to work so hard to do with their pit stop strategy early on in the race. And now that they're there, he's just driving at the pace that he needs to, as long as he can maintain that gap between himself and Dries Van Thor. And as, if he sees that coming down a little bit too much, he can press on because arguably they're all going to be on a similar strategy now to the end of the race. They've all got one yeah. more pit stop to do. They all pitted at exactly the right time as well. We're in the pit lane within a, a lap or half a lap of each other. Uh, they've all probably bolted on either a brand new set of tyres, the final one of the 18 allocated sets that they get, or they'll all be scrubbed to a similar degree. So it's all purely pace on circuit at the moment. And yeah, I think if, if, if he's got anything left, Dries van Thorpe will, uh, will struggle to catch Mauro Engel because we know that car is quick because the important part of qualifying, that was the rocket ship car, yeah, wasn't indeed. it? Yeah, uh, indeed. They've got to get these, this final stop done within effectively now half an hour. Yeah. Now, the only other thing that the teams have to factor in in all of this is not leaving it too late because let's say that you plan on doing that with five minutes to spare okay and you get a safety car absolutely then you can't complete the stop yep. in the regulation time so uh, the, the, the teams do need to have a think about when they serve that last one just in case yeah and you can't leave it too late because as we've seen earlier on 
you know, if you're in the right position at the track when there's about to be a full course course you're safety car, you can just about nip in. But if you're half the way around the circuit, yeah. not a chance. Now, number 33 Porsche, we saw Tim Heinemann take back from Mattia Cairoli. And he's also just put himself back ahead of Ralph Bowen, has he not? So he therefore in 11th place. Yeah, that was full position, wasn't it? So that is the Pro-Am car. That's fifth in Pro-Am going back ahead of the car that completes the Am podium at the moment. Ralph Bowen at the wheel of the black and gold number seven Herbeth Motorsport car. Losing the place on circuit, but as we've spoken about so many times, Ralph Bowen, how much of a fight would you put up for that? It's a Pro-Am car coming past you. You're on the podium in the AM category. Just don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Let it sell by. So Tim Heinemann, who was very impressive at Spa, uh, as was Matteo Cairoli, of course, uh, but uh, giving this car a real workover. Accelerating now. Headlights ablaze up towards turn 11, 12, end of the lap towards the hotel, past the bar, under the hotel, on towards the harbour. Great shot there of the cars coming underneath the hotel, right up against the wall. No runoff area there, although surprisingly, it's a part of the circuit that catches out relatively few. It does, yeah, absolutely. I think we have seen in the past a couple of cars literally just a, the slightest wheel touch against that barrier. But I think the only time I can ever recall we had a, an issue round at that corner was nothing to do with an incident. It was when the... Uh, VR46 Ferrari had an electrical problem at that part of the circuit and ended up stopping out on, on right. that part of the track a few years ago. So I think it's one of those corners that, at the moment, has has remained uh, fairly incident-free. Kind of look at it and expect it to be Abu Dhabi's version of uh, Montreal's Wall of Champions, yep. but uh, no, people do avoid it. Right, Tim Heinemann then, having gained that place, the next target is going to be Alessio Rivera. Trouble is, that's 70 seconds up the road, the uh, number 25 Ferrari. That's quite a big ask without the assistance of a safety car, isn't it? It certainly is, So that is probably going to be it for Tim Heinemann and the Herbert Motorsport squad. We've still got Mario Engel leading the way. Dries Van Thor not re uh, at all been able to eat any further into that advantage. If anything, it's just come back out again slightly, hasn't it, from first to second place. The lead advantage from Mercedes to BMW, the 99 to the 46. It's up to eight and three quarter seconds now as we continue to keep an eye on Tim Heinemann and what he's doing at the wheel of the 11th place Herbert Motorsport Pro-Am entered number 33 Porsche that was going so well early on in the race. It's the car that started from the inside of the second row of the grid, so had a brilliant qualifying, but then Antares out, had some sort of problem. Did, did we ever get to what the bottom of the problem was on the first no, lap of the race? No, I don't think we've ever found out, have we? No, we've not really heard from that team. Because it, it, uh, it started third and, was, yeah. and wasn't quite in last place by the end of the final of the first lap, but wasn't far off. Yeah, it was only not last because of Chris Roggett's spin, but yeah. it was lucky it went into limp home mode, wasn't it? Or got jammed in a gear, because it was slow from the first corner onwards. But uh, Tim Heinemann, who's been racing in the DTM this last uh, season, is uh, impressive whenever you see him in GT3 machinery, having only had one year in the cars. GT3 style cars in uh, DTM. He did drive in the Spa 24 hours. Still a bit more traffic to deal with before too much longer. Yeah. That will be the Audi of uh, uh, Xavier Knauf that he will look to try and thread his way through. So the Audi's running fourth in the AM class at the moment. Has had a bit of a yo-yo race, really, hasn't it, the Audi? It started, what was it, 19th, if memory serves me correctly. Yes, it is, as I look down at my piece of paper. It was running as high as the lead of the race at one point, largely because of all of the strange pit stop cycles that we were going through. Now it finds itself back down in 15th once more. So it's been it's been up and down. It's really a race of snakes and ladders, isn't it? Uh, but in part, you know, you've got a silver grady driver and three bronzes. So yeah. you put your silver yeah. in, it's going to go quicker, it's going to come up. Uh, and again, the reason, one of the reasons it was doing so well early on, yeah, you had Milka Pano doing good things on good pace, but you also had six, seven, All eight the cars, cars pit, yeah. taking yeah. early pit stops, and that gave us that, that quirky order. I mean, the lap times were good, and places were gained on merit as much as they were on pit stops of the pro cars. But, um, yeah, it, it, again, it's had pit stop penalties and track limit penalties, so it's it's had those to factor in as well. It's had a yeah, contact with the... the Gosner car was That's a right, yeah. motorsport car, which not only caused it a penalty, but it also is still carrying the, the scars of that, which is bound to affect the car because it's got that damage on the front left hand corner of it. it as we so. go back to Mauro Engel, who has now completed 311 laps, we have an hour and 10 minutes to go 
in the Lenovo Golf 12 Hours, the 13th running of the event, but the 12th running of it here at Yas Marina Circuit. And Maro Engel has now been involved in this driving stint for just over one hour. So if he wants to sort of split the stint in half, if he's going to double stint it, which I suspect they might do with Maro Engel towards the end of this one, then he could well be in in the next five minutes or so. Yeah, he needs to serve that uh, final regulation pit stop, or as they term it in the regs, the imposed pit stops. Uh, but uh, Engel and the Grupper M team will have worked out the plan, particularly off the laps, so and know exactly when they need to call the car in. There is number 61 Ferrari, which is in 17th place, Conrad Grunewald at the wheel of it. But interesting, isn't it, from a few hours back, being really on the, the, the edge, trying to fight back and, and get the lost lap back. Now, this car just looking unstoppable. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it, how the race has rather patiently just come back to them. They must have had great faith in themselves. Into the pit lane comes Conrad Grunewald. So the number 61 Ferrari in towards the pits for what one would imagine is its final pit stop. It clearly had an additional penalty to serve. That five second additional penalty has to take place once the car comes to a halt in the pit box. Everybody has to wait, count to five, and only then can you start the process of the refueling. Grunveld getting out of the car, which means we're going to get a final driver change in. And who might it possibly be? Well... Jean-Claude Sauder, possibly. I mean, Miguel Ramos was in not that long ago. Laurent Demise we've not seen him for a while, but I saw he was changed into his T-shirt in the background of a shot earlier, so right. unlikely to be him. It may well be done. Right, that looks like Miguel Ramos, doesn't it? It is, I think, yeah. I think you're right. Who, in fairness, is probably the fastest in that car anyway, given his experience and his success. So yet another set of the 18 new sets of Pirelli tyres go onto that car and an hour and eight minutes of the race to go. So the uh, last stop for the Ferrari, windscreen cleared. Some pit stops, you'll find they use the detergent and squirt and, and clean. Others, it's the tear-off windscreen, like you have a tear-off visor on a crash helmet in single-seater racing. Uh, but uh, there's a, a limited number of those, so they'll use those sparingly. So sometimes, as I say, it's the, um, the, the detergent, the clean fluid and then a cloth, but uh, the last in is one of those rip-off windscreens that comes off the car. Just look at all of the, the, the pepper marks on the windscreen as well on that car. You can see where bits of debris have just sort of peppered the windscreen on it. You can also see exactly the same there on the, the number 27 car that's still in the hands of Rob Bell. Rob is now three quarters of an hour into his stint. There are any cars that have not ticked off the 10 imposed pit stops have now got what, 22 minutes in which to do so. And after that point, if you haven't got through your 10 imposed pit stops, each one of which has to be 100 seconds in the pit lane from pit lane into pit lane out that's not the period you need to be stationary but from in to out 100 seconds and if you haven't got them all done with three quarters of an hour in the race remaining it's too late you'll be handed a penalty uh, what, what is the penalty for that it's a very draconian one if memory serves me correctly is it not uh, i want to say it's a three lap penalty uh, I, I, I might be confusing it with something else you are absolutely correct any car failing to complete the mandatory number of imposed pit stops in the race will receive a three lap penalty in the race for each occurrence. So, in other words, if you miss two, six. it's six. Yeah. Yes. Maths with Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> More next week. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> Another times table <laughs> next week. <laughs> Tune in. <laughs> so, a three lap penalty is what we're saying. But uh, in fairness, I mean, the teams will be checking with race control if they've got any doubts uh, and making sure they know because the last thing they want at the end of this is uh, to. to not do a 100-second pit stop and cop a three-lap penalty. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't go down well, would it? No. But, but as you also say, what they don't want to do is leave it too late and then all of a sudden a safety car comes out and as we know already from what we've said several times, you cannot count an imposed pit stop when the safety car is out right. there unless that pit stop is over five minutes. So, you know, at the very latest you could leave it if you want to risk it is probably an hour and 20 minutes to go and at that point the safety car would have to come out and you'd still just about get away with it. True enough. Ralph Bowen in for his last stop and the Audi in again. That should be its last stop, shouldn't it? It's not that long, but we put Xavier Knauf into that car. But uh, in it comes. I was going to offer you another pit stop point a moment ago, but I've, now it's completely gone out of my mind, so you'll have to <laughs> offer me that sentence again and see if it jogs an old memory. Alan. Or Chris. Well, it's Chris. Chris. I, I've, I've joined the uh, the pit lane a bit earlier, 
Uh, as you said, the pit lane now with what? 15 minutes to go before that window kind of closes where they have to do those 10 mandatory pit stops. The pit lane is starting to get a bit busy here. Herbert Motorsport are in there doing a driver change. The sister car will come in as well, the 33. I'm actually stood right next to the 46 garage as well because it looks like Dries Van Thor will come in in a little moment's time. We've got the two seats Motorsport car in as well. I can't quite catch the number because I'm currently having battery changes in the headset. So I can just make out, is that the two? No, is that the sister car? It's the uh, number, number three, three at two seats. It's the three. So here comes Dries Van Thor. Remember, they had that five second penalty as well for track limits that they have to deal with, and it's going to take an eternity. The gap when they came in was 13 seconds. Of course, that does uh, contribute to coming into the pit lane, but now stationary for five seconds. Herbert Motorsport are back out there. They've presumably done their last one there for the number seven. The 33 is about to come in as well. And, well, refueling is now underway for the 46. A fresh set of tyres for Dries Van Thor. And I guess he'll be good to go to the end of the race. Here comes the Herbert Motorsport car into its pit box as well. The team jump into action, refuel the car. Now, I don't see a driver for this second Herbert Motorsport car, so I have a feeling it will be. Now, who is currently behind the wheel of the 33 car? Tim Heinemann. So Tim Heinemann looks to be staying behind the wheel as there's no other uh, driver ready in the overall. So new set of slicks going on for Dries Van Thor. Remember, remember what's at stake here, a BMW overall victory here in the Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. They have never won the event overall. They are one of two manufacturers to not have done it, and they're the most likely chance that they could do it. Although, this pit stop is going to take some time. Thanks, Chris. Yep, yeah, so Dries Van Thor, the first of those running at the sharp end to head into the pit lane. The Team WRT BMW that was hoping that he could catch Mauro Engel and overtake the race-leading Mercedes. That being the case, it would have put BMW into a championship winning position potentially in the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli for the manufacturers category. Now that doesn't mean that Dries has still given up on that aspiration as yet. Into the pit lane comes the race leader so Mauro Engel at the wheel of the race leading number 99 car into the pit lane. As long as this pit stop goes to plan David, they're looking good with 60 minutes to go. Yeah and they've done this without a brake change haven't they? Unlike the two C's car of Jules Gounon, so uh, it's been a, a good recovery, if you like, from losing time early on with that loose wheel and the slow pit stop, uh, as now the car sits and not very much is happening other than what hopes, the fuel, which, yes, we can now see over the shoulder of the mechanic. So Mauro Engel's going to stay in the car, it seems, to the end. As soon as the fuel is done, part two of the pit stop can get underway. The car will go up, tyres off, a few tyres on, and then we'll be good for Mauro Engel to blast back into the race with Lucas Stoltz and Mikhail Grenier having done their work. Mauro is going to bring it home. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm your point there, David. Mauro will stay in the pit lane, uh, sit in the car, sorry. There are no other drivers suited to boot in, but there will be a driver change for the 77, though. Right, so Lorenzo Ferrari will bring that in in a moment. And you would have thought Lucas Hour would be going out in that, would you not? For the final hour? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, come of the hour. Come with the man. Come with the Lucas, yes, get in the, in the car. So Mauro Engel, good to go in the uh, Mamba Mercedes AMG. And into the pits behind has just come Lorenzo Ferrari. Right, Mauro Engel then blasts away. So the Angel, translated surname, Mauro, Eng Mauro Engel back down the pit road and he has got 61 minutes and change on the clock. Last pit stop done, now he's just got to keep out of trouble and bring it home. Just wondering what the relative pit stop times were for those particular cars that time through just to check that everything was okay it was a one minute and 41 for the 99 car so that is good and for team wrt it was one minute and 46 which is just as good so yeah. no net gain for either there because we know they had to be five seconds on the pit late team wrt so yes the the five second gain that was always going to happen in the pit stop is all that happened there was no more than that no, indeed so uh the Mercedes stop wasn't unduly long to give the advantage back to BMW, nor did BMW uh, WRT suffer any further loss. 25 Ferrari in as well now. So that was the car that was in the hands of Alessio Rivera. Again, looking at the driver pace of those cars, you'd double stint Alessio, wouldn't you? Yeah, and I think he's staying in. I've not seen the yep. door open yet. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, where possible, leave your fastest driver into the end. I know I keep banging on about it, but, you know, should there be a, a safety car late race, 
you can't have a slow guy in the car because you'll just get mugged. Yeah, you've got to have you've got to have your fastest driver in, and then you, you work your strategy back from that. Away blasts 77. Also got in the pit lane at the moment 75, which is the Sun Energy One car. That is all the way down towards pit lane exit end. You can see the gold car with the most flames across the bonnet of it being refuelled at the moment. That's another car that we think Philip Ellis will be staying behind the wheel of. There's no obvious signs of any driver change taking place there. But uh, we've also now got at the very bottom of the pit lane, pit lane entry, Jules Goudon is in. So the two C's motorsport crew go to work. Uh, service that car and Jules will remain behind the wheel so I think as I alluded to at the at the top of this hour just before you rejoined us I thought those drivers would go in I thought they would all double stint absolutely that's what the teams have done yeah but you know, as I keep saying it makes sense fastest yeah. driver in at the end you would do so so Jules Gounon may not be winning a race but he's seemingly heading for a championship now he certainly is and with now less than one hour to go in this 12th running of the Lenovo Golf 12 hour here in Abu Dhabi. Final round of the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli. Everybody is, for the first time really, since lap number one, back on the same page of the book in reality, or they certainly will be by the time we get to 45 minutes remaining in this race. So there still might be the odd car wanting to come in over the course of the next 10 or 12 minutes to tick off the final uh, imposed pit stop of the 10 that everybody has to do in the first 11 and a half hours of the race. But once we get to that point, then yeah, really, for the first time since lap one, when the first cars died for the pit lane to tick those pit stops off, everybody is on the same page. Yeah, finally. This is where we get to uh, an easy hour of the race where you can understand exactly who's done what. They've all read the wrong, they've all read the same book. It's just that they've all read it in a different order for the last 11 and a half hours. That's right. Rob Bell carries on and uh, Eddie Cheever in 93 behind. the background, uh, Marvin Kirchhofer. Again, who's going to stay in the yeah. McLaren as the fastest of the three drivers? He'll take that to the end. Looking for the 93, I think it was a driver change. Eddie Cheever got out of the car. Oh, okay. So it has been a driver change there for the 93. Right, it's not yet updated itself on the transponder uh, pit out, but we'll keep an eye to that. Thanks, Chris. So who would, who would you push back in for the final one for that one? Chris Froggett? I'd put Eddie Cheever in it myself. But, yeah, so uh, would I, uh, unless they want to put Jonathan Hoy in so that he can take it towards the checkered flag and claim the independence cup. Maybe, yes, that's a, an option, certainly. Don't, th don't seem to have talked about Chris Frog a great deal, though, in that car. I remember him doing two stints, but, but I don't remember much more not, than that, unless one, unless one of them was a double. Yeah. It's, um, it's all gone into one yeah. place, really. It's all... Yeah, information bleed over the course of the, the previous 11 hours, trying to keep the, all of the, the details together on it. We've still got Chris a few Frogger cars. started, didn't he? Uh, yes, he did, because yeah. he had the spin, didn't he, on That's the first right, lap? Yeah. Yeah. But after that, I think there's been... I think he got back in once. Much we've talked about him. OK. Uh, so, there, the next of the Ferrari serving a stop. Lilou Wadu for AF Corsa. French driver in the uh, Am Cup car. For the teams, they can tick this pit stop off and think, finally, that's it, last one done. <laughs> as long as it all still goes to plan in the remaining 56 yeah. minutes, of course. Yeah. We talk about the driver fitness, but lugging those wheels around, because it's only two mechanics allowed to do the four corners of the car, so one carries and one does the gun, but you know, doing that repeatedly, you've, you've, it takes it out of you, especially in this temperature and in overalls, because with refueling, you've got to have overalls on in the pit lane. Yep, and the, and the helmet on and the eye protection as well as part of the refueling process. The regulations are all very tight for the right reasons to protect everybody. So Mauro Engel is now on lap number 318. Remember, the record number of laps that we've had here was 359. That was in the January 2022 running of this race, last year's equivalent race, which was, remember, a full 12-hour race. We had seven safety car periods, of which 43 minutes just over it was behind safety car. We managed 335 laps, David. So we're perhaps not going to be too far away from that, but are we going to get there really in this remaining 55 minutes? It's possible. It is possible, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. We could well do it. Yeah. So Mauro Engel is the man in charge as he comes into turn 16 once again. Heading up towards the timing line, he's going to be mindful of the traffic just at the road, as in comes number 21 then, Joel Sturm, who should stay behind the wheel. 93, still being shown as Eddie Cheever, so uh, we need to try and unravel who was put into the Sky Tempest and McLaren, if Chris is right in saying there was a driver change. 
David Fuminelli in number 11. In. That number 11 car has started to come back into the mix, hasn't it, over the course of the last couple of hours. It had dropped quite a long way down through the order and was sort of circulating mid-teens for a period of time, but... Uh, has now worked its way back inside the top ten, was running in eighth place before it came into the pit lane. We've got the AM leading car in as well, which is Joel Sturm, the number 21 car in the pit lane. Amaro Engel looking to try to put a lap on Jules Gounon here, uh, because you've got the third place Mercedes not that far up the road from the leader. Chris? Uh, yes, just to confirm, 83 is being driven by Chris Frogger. Oh, okay. Process of elimination, his helmet is not there in the little cubby hole, and I've just been informed by the team as well not Eddie Cheever behind the wheel, it is indeed Chris Froggett, so you guys are right. Right, thanks for that. Yeah, still shown, as I say, as Eddie Cheever on the timing screen, but uh, one hopes that that will get uh, corrected in due course. Because at the moment, of course, it's showing a longer stint time than is accurate, because uh, the stint time runs when you're still in the car, and the timing and scoring he still is. Joel Sturm on his way down the pit lane. Uh, Jules Gounon, fascinating fact 37, is that he's been on the overall podium in every round of the championship this year in IGTC, whether he's been in a pro or a pro-am car on his way to winning the title here. Uh, yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Started with the win, didn't he, in Bathurst, and then third in Kyle Army, and second for the last two times out. And looking as though he's on for another third place here. So another solid season, another consistent season for the uh, Jules Gounon. Again, you can see the nose of that McLaren just bobbing up and down there as it heads into the heavy braking area at turn number five. Rob Bell behind the wheel of it. That car at the moment still continues to lead the Pro-Am category and, more importantly, has a buffer of one lap between itself and the car that's second in Pro-Am at the moment, which is this car here, the number 75 car in the hands of Philip Ellis. So over the start-finish line they go. Philip Ellis and, I would say, Dominic Bauman, probably the quicker of the two drivers in that particular yeah. car. Well, yeah, Philip Ellis gets quicker and quicker every season. Dominic Bauman has been around a lot longer. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Philip's an interesting one, really, because uh, he, he's of a British family that moved, or British and Swiss family that moved to Germany. Uh, he grew up in Mallorca, uh, took time out of racing to go finish his studies, came back into racing, won in Audis, uh, and then ended up uh, racing in Mercedes. But he's done all his mainland Europe racing, uh, really, uh, despite the British part of his, his heritage, he's only once raced in the UK, and that oh, was Donington it? this October. What was that? It was that in British, British GT. GT, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah of course he never was. raced yeah. in the UK yeah. before. Yeah, of course it was. Yeah. So he stood in for Johnny Adam, if you remember, uh, with James Cottingham. Cottingham. But uh, when I said to him, I can't think what you've ever raced in the UK before, help me out. He said, no, he said, I've not. it's only the third time I've been to the country. <laughs> well. <laughs> so I've certainly not raced it. <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah, that, I, I honestly didn't know that. Honestly didn't know. I'm surprised by that. So, yeah, that car is running second in Pro-Am at the moment. And the car that's third in Pro-Am is the number 11 Kessel Racing, now Scott Andrews-driven Ferrari. That was the car that was in the hands of David Fuminelli until a few moments ago and has just been handed over. Uh, so that's the top three in Pro-Am. The top three in Pro are the top three overall. So the 99 from the 46 and the... Uh, 14 and in AM let's just pick up on the top three in the AM category as we are 50 minutes away from the chequered flag uh, as it has been for so long in this race the number 21 car collection Porsche in the hands of Jol Sturm continues to lead the AM category second in AM is at the moment going the way potentially of the number three Mercedes of two C's that now have uh, Isa bin Abdullah Al Khalifa back behind the wheel and the third place car in Am is number seven which is Herbert's Motorsports car which has been handed over wasn't it that was in the hands of Ralph Bone it's now Alfred Renauer yeah. that's behind the wheel Chris has news from the pits yeah I just had a chat with the racing one team unfortunately the damage they sustained will take too long to fix so unfortunately they're out it happened on the right hand side of the car and it's possibly due to contact I was just speaking to Axel Jeffries about that so it's very unfortunate the only locally based team will not be finishing this race they had a very strong race as well uh, Ramos Azam was behind the wheel when it happened uh, due to no fault of his own of course and of course Axel Jeffries was scheduled to get back behind the wheel in the final hour what could have been well I guess we'll have to wait till the next Lenovo Golf 12 hours to figure that out Chris what was the damage that they sustained because we knew that they'd got this drama with the car we were hearing it was overheating but the actual damage I don't think we ever got to the bottom of yeah, well, they're inclined not to tell me exactly what's happened. They just said whatever it is is taking a long time. I'll go back in the garage and see if I can in inquire some more. 
to find out exactly what the issue was. All right, good man, thank you very much. But as you say, it's a real shame that the Seoul local team ain't going to get to the flag. 77, uh, we were right, that did put Lucas Auer uh, behind the wheel of the car that's in fifth spot. So it is Engel, Van Tor, Gounon, Bell, Auer, Sturm, Ellis, uh, Andrews, back in number 11 Ferrari, uh, Al Khalifa and Rovera to round out the top ten. And there are some star names there. Uh, very much so, such as the, the strength and depth that the field has this year. So I think the only one that probably surprised us of the uh, the cars were either driver changes we saw were taking place or uh, we knew drivers were going to double stick was probably the change from Eddie Cheever to Chris Froggart. But yeah. as we say, not seen much of Chris Froggart in the race, so that's probably why. Indeed so. Uh, and uh, Chris, you know, he's still a quick driver. Yeah. So as we've seen in, in the, the uh, sort of Pro-Am class of British GT and, and uh, Fanatec GT this year, he'll do a good job. He'll bring the car to the end. So the Gossners are set for their last stint. And the good news is the car looks like it's going to get to the very end, which for them is the target. You know, they're not here to win a class. They're here to enjoy themselves and, and be there at the end of 12 hours. Chris? Yeah, it is something to do with the suspension there for racing one now. Unfortunately, okay. puts them out of the race. Right, thank you. So suspension mallet is for Ferrari number 26. Ramos Azar having brought the car into the pit lane. And does that now pretty much clear everybody of their last pit stop? I think it probably does. I think it probably does. It was a driver change for the Gossner family in their MP Racing number 73 Mercedes. It's Thomas Gossner that gets the privilege of bringing the car towards the chequered flag. Right, OK. Um, time penalty has been racked up. Car number 93, which is the Sky Tempesta racing car, has picked up yet another track penalty. This is a car that's picked up several throughout the course of this race, whether it be in the first six hours or afterwards once the slate was wiped clean but it's a 10 second penalty now for track limits and because there's no further pit stops for those to be conducted in that will get added at the end of the race David I assume it will indeed yeah. and of course although it's Chris Froggart in the car now who's just got out of it Eddie Jeeva who does seem to have had a bit of previous for this um, I mentioned that whilst you were having yeah. your break no, I heard you, on. I yeah. heard you. Yeah. that's why I say it because uh, unfortunately Eddie we know he's quick but if anybody seems to have been uh, racking up the penalties or the warnings, it's been him, it seems. You know, I'm not, not saying that the others haven't had their moments, but um, uh, Eddie just seems to have, have, have been the more obvious one. So it'll be 10 seconds uh, added to that car's race time. And for the moment, that's OK. It won't drop it behind the 88 car of uh, Marvin Kirchhofer. But if Marvin gets on with the programme in the remaining 47 and a half minutes, then it might get a bit more imperiled. Scott Andrews still pressing on at the wheel of the Kessel Racing Ferrari that occupies third place in Pro-Am currently. Where is the car that's second in Pro-Am? Well, at the moment, it's a lap ahead of him and is in the hands of Philip Ellis. So Scott Andrews comes over the start-finish line. I think this will ultimately then put him onto the same lap as Philip Ellis, but the relative gap between the two of them is going to be a, a fairly large one. So through he goes over the start-finish line. And no, he's still a lap adrift, isn't he? So it is... No, he's... Uh, yes, he is. Yeah, yeah. still a lap yeah. adrift, isn't he? Yeah. So I thought that would get him on the same lap. But no, there's a, a full lap between second and third in Pro-Am. And there's another lap, I think, between the race leader and second in Pro-Am. So they're all spread out by a lap at this stage. And when you get to this point of the race, David, and you're you're a lap adrift of the car that you want to catch it still doesn't mean that you slow up particularly you might settle for it to a larger degree and not push quite as hard but you also know that anything could still happen it's true enough 46 minutes to go the car has a spin you yeah. catch it and who knows yeah absolutely right and uh, also if you're a don't want to say proper racing driver you want to go flat out yeah. don't you you don't want to just go around at 80% on a sort of uh, fuel conservation run. If you can go flat out, that's that's why you're here. Well, what was Mark Radcliffe saying earlier on to, to Alan Hyde is that, you know, it is a beautiful circuit with a beautiful backdrop, but you don't really look at it when you're no, racing. That's true. <laughs> it's true enough. Uh, uh, Chris? Yeah, I was just in the pit garage here for Mercedes-AMG Team Grouper M. Of course, Mikhail and Luca sitting comfortably, just watching their uh, co-driver, Mario Engel, uh, essentially trying to challenge here for the, the victory and keep uh, Team WIT at bay. 
they did say that they are closely monitoring it and the team WRT are getting quicker as the uh, as we get closer and closer here to the end of the Lenovo Golf 12 hours. So it certainly looks like they're not confident enough that they're 100% going to get this victory, but they're keeping a very close eye out on what's going to happen. Now, what I want to do is I want to go on to the other side of the garage and ask the same question to the 30 to the 46 team and see what their answer is. So the gap is 13.3 seconds, and last time the BMW was uh, two tenths of a second quicker. So you're right, it's a, a, a shade faster, but it needs to be a, a bigger gain than that. And as I've been saying, I still think that if he needs to, Maro could just turn the wick up if he really felt that that BMW was getting too close for comfort. Yeah, we were saying earlier on, we think that Mara's probably got a little bit in reserve. We know they've all pitted at similar times. If anything, yeah. Dries van Thor pitted a lap earlier than the 99 last time through. He was the first yeah. in, wasn't he, of the lead yeah. three? So um, <laughs> you could argue, subject to the, the tyres that they put on, um, or certainly fuel-wise, he might have a tiny, tiny bit left, uh, less uh, in that car. But, yeah, I mean, the rate of close, if you're going to chip away at two-tenths of a second, you, you're never going to get anywhere near it, are no. you, with maybe another... 22, 23, 24 laps to go in this one. So we should be hovering around 350 laps by the end of this one. Pretty there much, yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, Vantor's uh, only 20 seconds ahead in terms of a stint. So they came in pretty much at, at the same time. Right. Right? There's not that much to choose between them. Uh, and in terms of drivers playing it cool and saying, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're not, not sure, you know, we're not looking confident. I can't remember a time ever in a race with, <laughs> if you like 45 minutes to go where drivers said yeah yeah we've got this we've popped yeah, it up it's know. in the bag <laughs> yeah that, that, they always sort of uh, try and play it down however confident they might feel you know there's always that well we don't want to speak too soon kind of attitude isn't there well the problem is also you know we, we can only tell on what's going on from the outside of the car uh, they're never going to tell us what's going on inside the car you know if Ian Logging hadn't have mentioned about the rubber pickup on his we're on his boot and how that was affecting him we wouldn't have known we'd seen the car had lost a couple of places but couldn't really tell that it was a problem that had affected him for the whole stint out of all the problems to have yeah, yeah. And, and the way that nick yaleli was driving you know, was he losing that much time with the problem that he had with the seating position no nothing obvious from from outside the car no exactly exactly right over the timing line then goes ferrari number 11 so uh, scott andrews with his chance to shine now, pressing on, but the next target for him is uh, Mark said, Philip Ellis, who is another lap up the road. So he needs Phil to have a problem, and his last lap was a 53.2, and Scott Andrews is not as quick anyway. No, not at all. So for Scott Andrews at the wheel of the Kessel Racing Ferrari, the car that runs third in Pro-Am, the next car that he's caught is the car that runs third in the AM category overall. So both of these cars, the Porsche and the Ferrari, potentially heading towards the podium uh, once the race finishes. But back down in the pit lane is Chris with some more news. Yeah, speaking of podiums, I just had a quick chat with uh, Nick from Team uh, 46 there for Team WRT. Same question, different answer. They're saying, yeah, we can do it because, of course, Dries Van Thor, while he has 13 seconds between himself and the race leader, He's gathered that he's got that time back in previous stints. So it seems to be Nick and the team are not too worried about this. And we're, we're looking at a possible fight all the way to the very end of the Lenovo Golf 12 hours here. And what a way that will, what a way to end today's race that will be. Could we, for the first time, see BMW on top? It's possible because he's taken another two tenths out, but with 42 minutes to go and still 12.6 seconds. Uh, yeah, he's chipping away, he's going the right way about it. Even if he catches Mario Engel, he's still got to find a way past, so it's not going to be easy. Uh, yes, you can understand why the BMW team are optimistic, because there's always that potential, there's always that chance. And right now, fractionally faster is the BMW, but he's not hacking into the gap, is he? No, he's not hacking into the gap whatsoever. And, uh, um, you know, it would be nice to see uh, another manufacturer win here in the Gulf 12 hour, but BMW have never really mounted a, a full pro assault before at it we've seen the century motorsport car out on an occasion or two haven't we where yeah. we saw darren young and dan harper who went on to win the british gt championship this year but they didn't have the look here with the century motorsport car last year but that was a pro-am car it's the first time we've had an all pro bmw so arguably it's the first opportunity for them to, to try and mount a challenge for an overall win but it looks as though at the moment 
unless Dries van Tor can find a little bit of something or Maro Engel makes a mistake, but they don't happen very often, if at all, then it certainly looks as though Mercedes would be heading towards what potentially could be their third ever win. It would be the second with the AMG Mercedes, but they did win, didn't they? Black Falcon back with the old SLS back in the day. Yeah, that's the third running of, the, of this event. Gosh, that dates things, doesn't it? It's a car you <laughs> barely see, but they were they were very, very impressive bits of kit when they first came out, almost looking sort of futuristic with the gull wing doors. Uh, on this lap, Mauro Engel was quicker than Van Tor in the first sector. So he stretched it a bit, he then lost out in the middle sector, but he's had a bit of traffic to contend with on that map as well. And any traffic that Engel has to get through, of course, Van Thor will a couple of laps later. Uh, yes, and that's the thing, it just ebbs and flows, does it, all of the time, like a little piece of elastic. There's more work still to be done for the sole Audi, which is back in the hands of the starting driver, Milka Panu, who is now trying to wiggle his way through a past Thomas Gossner's car. So the Audi is fourth in the AM category, and by the look of things, is just going to miss out on a podium. Again, it's a further lap adrift of Alfred Renauer's Herbert Motorsport Porsche, so it looks as though, yeah, unless they can find something or the Porsche ahead has a problem, then... Audi's just going to come up short on a potential podium in AM. Uh, yeah, but the car it's chasing for position uh, overall is Philip Eng's BMW. So you've got an AM car chasing a pro car there. Uh, I don't think Milka Panu is going to do it, but uh, it'll be interesting to compare his lap times against those of Philip Eng. So out of the chicane goes Mauro Engel. On this lap, he again is fractionally slower than Van Thor in the first sector. Lead gap down again, 11 and a half seconds last time. So. Another lap where it's gone in the right direction as far as WRT is concerned, despite this gammy pedal box. Uh, yes, which they seem to have been able to cope with them rather well, don't they? So it's somewhat aided by the fact that Dries van Thor is the shortest of the three drivers and the pedal box is jammed in the short position. So it's far more comfortable or less uncomfortable, depending on which way you want to look at it, for, for Dries van, van Thor than it was for the likes of uh, um, the previous drivers that were getting out, the likes of Valentino Rossi and Nick Yellowly. But hopefully we can still see them through and on to the podium. Uh, still, Maro Engel continues on his merry way. He's not pushing quite as much, I don't think, there, because you could just see, you know, the amount of gap that he was leaving between the edge of the car and the Armco barrier, that's at least probably two or three inches further away from the barrier than he was earlier on. So just that alone tells you that he's got something in reserve. Yeah, I, I still think he's being careful. Like I say, it doesn't matter if he wins by a, a thousandth of a second or by a lap, as long as he wins. Uh, and so Mauro Engel, with all of that experience uh, of... of international GT racing and of that car knowing exactly what he's doing with it 11.7 seconds now is the margin because on that last lap actually he was quicker again than Van Thor. Yeah so uh, only by a couple of tenths at the very very most or just under a couple of tenths and now Dries Van Thor has also got some traffic to deal with which is going to be Thomas Gosner that will have to move out of the way then he'll very quickly catch the Audi there after a flash of the lights he's going to try around the outside is he on the run towards turn five Thomas Gosner moves across the nose of him so Dries van Thor gives another flash of the lights and the Mercedes again doesn't really move out of the way the Audi is also now coming into play as well which needs to hopefully allow the race leader to carve his way through but they're not making it easy no, for him are they no uh, and this is really going against Van Thor's chance to, to bring the gap down to Angle because he's hemorrhaging time stuck in the traffic. Uh, Milka Panu is not that slow relative to the BMW, but Thomas Gossner was a little bit wayward, I think. He might have been trying to get out of the way, but in doing so, got himself in the way. Finally, Van Thor is through, as also is number three now, Issa Al Khalifa, coming up to have a go at Milka Panu. So, uh, yeah, Van Thor lost, what, three corners worth of a run there. Yeah, and for Dries Van Thor, that is not exactly what he wants he wants to try and catch the car ahead if he knows he can catch Maro Engel he then needs to allow enough time to try and work his way past if that's even possible at this stage of the race depending on what Maro Engel's got left back up his sleeve and remember if that were to happen we would see a swing in terms of the championship standings for the manufacturers at the moment if it stays where it is Mercedes would pick up the manufacturer title in the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli here at Gasparino the final round of the 2023 championship but if Maro Engel stays where he is and Jules Goudon remains where he is, the championship title will go in the hands of the three-pointed star of Mercedes. So the number 99 Mercedes only got into the lead on the uh, ninth hour, and number 46 BMW was outside the top ten at the end of the first hour, so they've had a, a real rise in fortunes, uh, those two cars, over the course of the race, and start the next lap 14 seconds apart, so that's how much, again, uh, proof of Van Tor losing out in the traffic because the uh, gap shot up. He lost 2.3 seconds on that lap. 
Yeah, frustrating, is it? But you also can't afford to trip over that traffic, can no. you? We saw very late on in the race last year, wasn't it, where one of the Audis caught a, a GT4 car in the wrong place, made the wrong decision as to which way to go, and all of a sudden a front-running oh, car right, yeah. was out very, very late on into the race. That is Marshall, wasn't it? I uh, think you might be right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for now, at least, uh, Mario Engel has a, a slightly greater gap, but uh, we'll see what Van Thor can do once he's finally cleared the traffic. He's uh, bin Abdullah Al Khalifa, still looking to see if he can unpick the car ahead of him, but that's Marvin Kirchhofer that lies ahead of him, so you would expect that car to certainly not make things easy. It's an AM car that's trying to apply the pressure, but Kirchhofer is already starting now gap that Mercedes that he had worked his way through a past uh, just a few moments ago. Not for position because the two seats motorsport Mercedes has had a fairly untroubled run again in ninth position and is looking good for second in the AM category, whereas it hasn't quite all gone to plan for the Garage 59 number 88 McLaren, which lies seventh in Pro Am and is 14th overall. The overall race leader is about to conclude a further lap here, so we'll be heading on to lap number 330 this time through. Mauro Engel, and as a lap time as he comes over the start finish line, it's a woman at 53.3 from him that time through. And what does the lap time look like from Dries van Thor? Is the lap going to come down a little bit more? The gap between them now, he's had a clear lap on this occasion at the wheel of the BMW. Through he goes. No, three tenths of a second slower, so the gap is now 14.3 seconds from first to second. So, advantage Mercedes once again, Engel getting away, building that gap as uh, Dries van Thor, partly because of the traffic, uh, falls back. Number 25, Alessio Rivera goes through. He's 10th, getting himself ahead of Panu's 16th placed Audi. And through turn three comes that charging Ferrari in the background. You've got the Gossner still going. Thomas Gossner at the wheel, that car 19th. Uh, and in last place. Now we've got a Ferrari shown as being in the pit lane, Conrad Grunewald's car, but that has been there for half an hour. Now why do you, why is that, Chris? Do we know why 61 is still in the pit lane and has been there for such a long time? No, I guess it's my mission now to go walk down it pit lane is, I'm afraid, out. yes, unless there's an, an obvious answer, but uh, I know that car's been in the wars a little bit, but uh, it's still being shown as in the pits for you know, the, the, the best part of 30 two minutes now the clock's still ticking so that's the, the the final question mark i think in the race as to what's happened to that car as maro Engel then ticks off the last few corners of lap 330 out of turn 13 he comes under the w hotel and then down towards the completion of the lap in sectors on this lap he was a tenth slower or just under the van Thor in sector one and van Thor pulled back a couple of tenths in sector two so uh, when the traffic permits, the BMW is still quick, but uh, Mauro Engel, with built the advantage, is going to be uh, uh, difficult, I think, to have that prize away from him. So Chris Froggart interview, number 93 McLaren. Behind is number 21 Porsche, that's sixth, Joel Sturm at the wheel of it. And that car has done an absolutely outstanding job and has done uh, so much for, to uphold Porsche honour in this race. Uh, one of the things I was going to mention earlier on, uh, when I had a, a, a brain freeze, a train of thought, Mark, when I said about pit stops, I was going to say something. It was going back to, to a point you'd made about safety cars, which you know you might be hoping for for your chances late in the race. And at this point, teams might be thinking, well, you know, there's no chance of a, a, another safety car because there's no huge battle of cars where you might get people to trip over themselves. But yeah, all three of those long full course yellow and safety car periods we'd had were all single car incidents. They were, they? yeah. No multi-car incidents that brought about any safety car periods in this Every one, yeah. car just did it on its own. On its own, yeah. 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 They, were, they were at no point pushed. No. No. So it doesn't necessarily follow that just because there isn't a, a massive battle of cars, there's not going to be drama somewhere. Uh, final, final stop for number two Audi and Milka Panu stays behind the wheel of that car. Milka Panu gets going now. So... Uh, that car blasts down the pit road. That, I don't reckon, was 140 seconds. But anyway, it's the last stop done. That car soldiering on in the race. 
it would have had to have done its last stop 15 minutes ago, wouldn't it? It would anyway, you're yeah, quite right. Yeah, so yes. it, it must yeah. have been a, a, an unexpected one, a splash and dash, uh, maybe an issue with the tyre, so they opted to change all four. So, yes, so uh, that wouldn't have counted anyway. It's as quick as they could do it. So if they haven't already ticked off the 10, they'd be in trouble anyway, wouldn't they? have larger problems to worry about. Well, there is that, yes. Now, there is Chris Froggart in the McLaren being given a pretty tough time by the Ferrari. Now, which one is that? Is that 20? Which would mean it's Lilo Wadu's car. Lilo Wadu in 17th place. Another lap down. Coming down now towards turn five at the end of that first section of the circuit. The lights of the hotel in the background twinkling over the circuit. Incredibly futuristic building, which is another focal point as the leader comes into view for the 332nd time, so Mario Engel now just ticking off the laps, keeping out of trouble. And this, in a way, is, is the, the sort of reassuring way to end a race, isn't it? Without having to be thinking about catching anybody or being caught by anybody or fending anybody off, every back marker he comes up against, Mario can just take his time, work out where the gap is, work out whether they've seen him, more importantly, and then go for it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really makes you wonder. I go back to the, the second pit stop that they did, where they just managed to sneak in and commit to the pit stop just before they were not able to do so with that full course caution. Whereas the number 77 car, they didn't quite get that one done. And it does make me wonder if, if that split second decision and that split second they made it into the pits to allow that to count as one of their pit stops, is that the difference between them running in first and running where the sister car is in fifth? Uh, possibly, possibly. Uh, Chris? 61 is a fuel-related issue or a technical issue. That's what I've been informed by the team. OK. Thank you very much. So, uh, technical woes of some description for Conrad Grunewald's car. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to have a quick round of ifs and buts, um, number 14 had that brake change stop for 3 minutes and 45 seconds. If they hadn't done that and rolled the dice and gone to the end, would that still be in the lead of the race? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's those fine margins, yeah. that's those very fine margins that it comes down to, because, as you say, when, when all of the drivers largely lap at a, an identical pace, all of the manufacturers, whether it be Mercedes, BMW, McLaren, Porsche, Ferrari, the balance of performance in theory means they're all the same. They all run the same control fuel. They all run the same control tyre, of which they're all allocated the same amount. It is those fine margins that make the difference because it, it can't yeah. be anything else. No, absolutely right. There is the second place car then. So 13.7 seconds is the margin and we're into the last half an hour of the Lenovo Golf 12 hours. So 28, 28 and three quarter minutes remain. And in third place, it remains Jules Gounon, who in turn is two laps up on Rob Bell, who is the Pro-Am leader, so that's not going to shuffle. Uh, now, Rob Bell is five seconds ahead of Lucas Auer, who is catching. So fourth and fifth could be where the battle comes. It's Pro-Am versus Pro. Rob might decide if he is caught just to let the car go, because there's nothing to really fight for. He wants his class win. But equally, every driver wants the best possible result they can get, don't they? They want the best possible result that they can get. I would imagine if Rob Bell were in third place and were getting caught, it might be a different story, because yeah. they'd like an overall podium as well if they could. But fourth? Mm, no, I'd stick with the class win, I think. But we'll have to wait and see. Rob Bell will be thinking about the customer as well, Mark Radcliffe, won't he? Where is he? that? Yes. Number two Audi is under investigation for a short pit stop. I told you it wasn't 100 seconds. You're right, they should have done them all by then, but it's being looked at anyway. <laughs> right, yes, that's got me scratching my head in two areas now. One, why is it under investigation? But two, if it is under investigation, why did they leave it until so late to do the pit stops? Precisely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, it, it gave the feeling, as you say, that it was a, a non-imposed because of, of, of another problem type of pit stop. Anyway, uh, Rob Bell then, yes, being chased by Lucas Auer, and Lucas Auer in turn is being chased by that car. So fourth, fifth and sixth, actually, are all building up, aren't they? Because Joel Sturm is going after Lucas Auer and was quicker last time than Auer, who in turn was quicker than Bell. So that's concertinery, fourth, fifth, sixth. This is going to be a good one, isn't it? Yeah, and we can see that uh, uh, the cameras have picked up on them as well as they head down in towards the braking area for turn number five that is and then start to work their way onto the big long straight that brings them all the way down into the left and the right kinks at turn number six and seven and then the flat out turn number eight and then again it's another long long straight down there so here comes Rob Bell he's there in fourth position he heads uh, up towards turn number five Lucas Auer, Jolström will be next up as they continue to build the speeds once more so McLaren, Porsche uh, Sorry, uh, McLaren, Mercedes, Porsche, yeah. all getting close to each other in the closing stages of this one. 
Then another lap back, Philip Ellis, and another lap back, Scott Andrews. So nothing's necessarily going to change there. Philip Ellis has just gone over the timing line as you look at Rob Bell, who, what, two years ago now, was the quickest man up the hill at Goodwood at the Festival of Speed, who's won Brock Pan Endurance Series, he's won his class at Le Mans, and uh, as we were saying earlier on, uh, despite his McLaren factory driver status, still perhaps a little bit underrated, wrongly. But, what's what's uh, Brother Matt doing nowadays? He spends most of his time racing in America, right. I think. I think he also has a either ELMS or, or Road to Le Mans. Uh, the Michelin Cup. Michelin program. Cup, yeah. But yeah. largely, I think he's in the States. Yeah, he was a late, late starter in motor racing, but uh, has, like his brother, carved a good sports car career. So over the start finish line he comes. And then look and see as to what the relative gap is behind. Lucas Auer is just four seconds off him. And then another second and a half off that is the old Sturm. So there goes the McLaren through turn three and turn number four and if you look at the background of the shot you might just about see the number 77 Mercedes as uh, he heads once more in towards the braking area for uh, the next of the corners so the gaps haven't really closed up between them have they uh, that time through Rob Bell 54-1 three tenths of a second quicker was Lucas Auer yeah no seven tenths of a quicker second quicker was Joel Sturm so they are all closing up that's for sure yeah the uh, Sturm trooper is definitely the man to watch out of all of this in sixth spot but again how hard does he really need to push because he wants to win his class uh, the thing is he's just a quick driver so uh, tell him to slow down if you wish but uh, it's not really in his makeup no not at all keep driving flat out until the very end and what well, we've actually got a two uh, three cars that are in entirely different classes as well haven't we got a pro-am yeah. car getting caught by a pro car which in turn is getting caught by an am car so it's largely just for bragging rights and the overall position it's certainly not going to affect the podium positions potentially of each car unless they trip over each other they catch each other and then start to trip over each other but that would surprise me because why would you at this stage Lucas Auer pressing on at the wheel of the number 77 car can now just about see Rob Bell even through the corners he will be able to see him down the straight we've also got by the look of things Alessio Rivera looking to try and make progress and Out of the way around Tim Heinemann's, Tim Heinemann's just Heinemann's past, past him, him. Yeah. yeah yeah that is fourth position isn't it so Tim Heinemann now up into 10th position Alessio Rivera down into 11th place and that will be a change for 4th and 5th in the Pro-Am category I hope we see more of Tim Heinemann in GT3 uh, next year not just in the, the DTM because again he's, he's looked very handy in these cars in this race but he's into the top 10 as you say uh, so that's a change of 4th in Pro-Am also that's Lucas Auer making his way through and 77 Mercedes still hanging on a 5th place the gap to Rob Bell 3.1 seconds last time the lap time about nine tenths quicker so it's a, a significant game yeah you could tell it was a game because he's appearing ever more in the camera shot now uh, is uh, when we go to the Rob Bell camera shot you can see uh, Lucas Auer ever more in the background of it there's still a little bit of traffic to deal with as well for Rob Bell that he might catch maybe in the next lap couple of laps but they all blast their way down the long straight and then head up towards the braking area for the next section of the circuit which is going to be what turn number six and turn number seven is it no it's turn number five and they're just working their way through now no it is now turn number six turn number seven i should say but they're heading their way through now so safely out of that through the flat out kink at turn number eight here comes rob bell in what is the fourth place mclaren there goes lucas hour in the fifth place mercedes and then just behind that is joel Sturb still pushing hard in the am category leading porsche for car collection motorsport he is uh, still the quickest of the three of them at the moment so the gaps narrow bell goes through hour goes through and the even brighter headlights behind joel sturm and then the seventh place car has just gone over the timing line as these cars wriggle their way to the end of the lap so uh, philip ellis in seventh place has just started the lap but uh, he's also lapped down on them anyway so in terms of shuffling four fifth six is really the best battle to be keeping an eye on which we're doing and there is 21 joel sturm then Coming out of 14 through 15 is Rob Bell towards the last corner on the lap. So he turns right, makes the run now up towards the timing line once more. And we'll be getting the information from Bass Linders and everybody else at Optimum Motorsport as to where uh, the car of Lucas Hour is, where indeed Joel Sturm is. And the answer to Lucas Hour is two seconds back. So the gap is certainly coming down. And with 22 minutes to go, that's going to be a change, isn't it, before the end? It certainly will be. It looks that way. Catching is one thing, but then he's got to try and find his way through past the car of 
Rob Bell, it always amazes me when you have, you know, a long 12 hour race, you have different driver combinations, Pro Am, Am and Pro, that after the best part of what 11 hours and 40 minutes of racing, we've still got three cars together that are separated by less than four seconds. Yeah, yeah, and uh, different types of car as well. You know, a McLaren is a very yeah. different type of car from a Mercedes, and a different again from a Porsche. Yeah, and it's not like as though it's IMSA racing, whereas you get a bit of debris on the track and they'll throw a caution every time and bring out another safety car. You know, we've been flat out racing with only, was it three or four full course cautions throughout the course of this one? Four, probably. Yeah, we had one full course yellow for the cone, didn't we? And then the three accidents. Three accidents, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the battle for fourth then continues. Lucas out chipping away. Don't forget that's another car that is to score IGTC points. So it's fourth in IGTC. It is fifth in the race itself. Joel Sturm's car is not a IGTC point scorer. It's just here for the race, as it were. But Lucas Auer accelerates through and he's got Rob Bell very definitely in his sights now but Joel Stern's got them both in his sights so uh, it's uh, 1.7 seconds really covering those two cars now as they come up through turn 14 but even when Lucas Auer gets onto the back of Rob Bell I don't think Rob's going to make it a, an easy pass <laughs> is he? No absolutely not yeah the man from the northeast is a wily old fox he's not going to let them through at all and you can tell that uh, Lucas Auer is pushing there because we're, we're back to his car being literally millimetres from the barriers he came out of turn 14 from underneath the W Hotel that time through so another lap chalked into the book that is now through turn one they will safely go Rob Bell is now on his 330 fifth lap at this stage the race leader is on lap number 337 but Lucas Auer chipping away he was nearly nine tenths of a second quicker than Rob Bell last time through and he's now only a second behind him yeah the move's going to come I think maybe even down to the chicane on this lap and that is 75 Mercedes off the road of Philip Ellis that was in seventh place now he's got it going again you can see the tar marks where he got it wrong but out of nowhere comes a little drama like that so Yellow flag was shown, yellow flag will go back in. Philip Ellis gets away, but out of nowhere, all of a sudden, a spin. Yeah, and, and that's why you've got to keep pushing. You just never know. Scott Andrews would be the man that potentially could benefit out of that, had that not have been able to restart that car, because the Castle Racing Ferrari, remember, is running third in Pro-Am. The car that's just recovered from the spin is running second in Pro-Am. There's still a lap between the pair of them, but had that have been a problem for Philip Ellis, it would have put potentially that number 11 Castle Racing Ferrari a further place up in terms of the potential podium positions in the Pro-Am category we've still got this great fight going on for fourth for fifth for sixth it's still Rob Bell from Lucas Auer but Lucas Auer has now fully caught Rob Bell Rob Bell will not make it easy and this is fully now going to bring into the mix as well Joel Sturm at the wheel of the Porsche we are not yeah. quite that yet there with a three car battle but we're not going to be far away yeah the longer the Mercedes is trapped behind the McLaren the easier it's going to be for Joel Sturm to get up with the pair isn't it because right now Lucas Auer has done part one he's done the catching now he's going to do the passing uh, Rob Bell just ahead of him then as they come up towards turn 16 the Mercedes closing under braking the Porsche closing again onto the back of Auer so here they come we're almost three for fourth over the line goes Bell goes Auer goes now 21 of Sturm the gap between Bell and Auer 0.384 of a second and it's 11 tenths covering the three as they go out of turn one now you'll start to see where the strengths of the two cars come into play, where the McLaren is the better, where the Mercedes is the better. Yep, so through turn number two and turn number three, down through the gradient that brings them back down out of turn number four. Now uh, Rob Bell will just need to watch his mirrors and see in the background what is going to happen with Lucas Auer. He shows the nose of the Mercedes to the McLaren, but it's all about getting cleanly off this corner for Rob Bell. And it looks as though Lucas Auer mid-corner as he gets on the power that little bit early, just swiggles and waves around a little bit. Into the pit lane comes the car that was running second in Pro-Am in the hands of Philip Ellis that had the spin. Sun Energy are in, and Chris is down there in the pit lane. You know, I was literally just talking to someone else from the Golf 12 Hour here. They asked the question, is anyone coming in for a splash of dash? We got our answer right in front of us. This is unusual. The 15-minute uh, mark of the, what, 45 minutes to go is already clocked by us. And the 45 car, the 75, excuse me, is down in its uh, pit box. And they're actually looking at the left side of the car by the looks of it. And they're putting it in the garage. There is a problem for the 75. So now... I will make my way down there and I'll try to find out what the issue is. And yeah. while that's been going on, we've got this change then. So Lucas Auer and Joel Sturm both ahead of Rob Bell. It all kicked off down at turn six, didn't it? But in fairness, Rob knew which battle to fight. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think he's maybe run out of tyres on that car as he just hasn't got the car underneath him that he wanted. And therefore, yeah, as disappointing as it is that he's lost a couple of places, one to Lucas Auer and one to Joel Sturm, what he hasn't done is lose any places to any cars in Pro-Am. Pro car's gone through, Am car's gone through, two places lost, still leads Pro-Am and is still going to head towards the class win. That's the important thing. And going back to 75 then, Philip Ellis to the pit. So uh, maybe it was more than just a spin. Maybe there was a problem that caused it to spin and he's brought it back. Uh, but either way, that car uh, is suffering. Now, driving standards flag for Dries Van Thor for track limit. Remember, they already caught one penalty on that last pit stop. Another one would have to be a time penalty post-race, but 75 now looks as though it is in big strife, doesn't it? The tyres and wheels going back on, so whatever issue they found, they're hoping to get the car back out because they just need to get it to the end and get some points here. They certainly do, so they're already going to, I'm sure by the time they get it back out, drop it off the Pro-Am podium potentially, so it's being wheeled back out. Quick inspection, quick check that everything is OK. They've got to bring it back out on the dollies. They will then put the air jacks back into the down position, lift the car off, take the dollies out from underneath, fire it up and get down pit road because they were on for second place in Pro-Am. They might just about still hang on to third in Pro-Am as Mauro Engel now continues to lead the way. He heads out of the turn number five the 340th time. We said we might get to about 350. I don't quite think we're going to get there in the end. Philip Ellis rejoins. There is Mauro Engel then, as you say, on lap 340 with 15 minutes of the race to go. And a flying lap is around the 154 mark at the moment. Out of turn seven, he comes then with Vantor 11.9 seconds back last time around. And Jules Gounon, we've not really touched on for a while, uh, but the uh, champion-elect in IGTC is just ticking off the laps and set to bank the point. Doesn't have to do anything other than just finish where he is. Likewise, Jonathan Hui watching Chris Froggart bring his car home to become Independence champion. Yeah, that will please them, won't it? It's been a, a long old season for them, and I think we might be able to hear from Chris down there in the pit lane with the news. Yeah, I don't know how much he saw of that, but Kenny Habul was very, very uh, energetic about that. He was trying to push the team to get the car out as soon as possible. It was a brake pedal issue. Okay. Apparently it was stuck. So the team have got back out there, which is great news. But like you said, have they fallen back far enough to drop off the podium? It also accounts for the spin that we saw at turn five as well. Right, OK, so thanks, Chris. That explains part of the story for us. Brake issues for 75. Uh, I think I said a while ago, didn't I, about the sting in the tail in races like this. Yeah. And there's another one. Within the last 15 minutes, all of a sudden, off the road with an issue, a car that's gone like clockwork. Well, pretty much all season, never mind all day. And was I not talking about the number 11 Kessel Ferrari and that you know, you've got to still keep pushing because yeah, you never know. And yeah, it was that know. very car, yeah. wasn't it? That yeah. I said, you'll keep pushing. Yeah. You never know what might happen. Well, that's put it on the, uh, uh, ahead of it, never mind on the same lap, but has moved it ahead. So into seventh place now, Scott Andrews, and down to eighth, Philip Ellis, who in turn is going to be being chased by Isa Al Khalifa because those two cars run on the same lap now. 13 minutes and change on the clock in this Lenovo Gulf 12 hours and in this last round of Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli. It does look as though the Sun Energy team have potentially lost out on a Pro-Am podium because the Herbeth Motorsport car of Tim Heinemann has gone through the number 33 Porsche into third place in Pro-Am. That puts it up to ninth place overall. So that is a bitter, bitter pill to swallow for Sun Energy. So, so late into this race with only 15 minutes to go. Looking good for second in the class. They're now going to drop off the podium. So Dries van Tort still there in second place at the wheel of the number 46 team WRT. BMW, we saw briefly, he is now 11 and three quarter seconds adrift of Mauro Engel with Jules Gounon looking to complete the podium. And then thereafter, it's the number 77 BMW of Lucas Auer, which still hasn't as yet shaken away Joel Sturm at the wheel of the number 21 Porsche. Yellow flag at turn number 11 is the information we're receiving. And that's an off, and it's late in, in the race. And that is Thomas Gossner at the wheel of the MP Racing Mercedes. Now, he's had the spin at turn number 11. Now, one would have thought that was probably coming quick through turn number 10, lost the tail end of the car, and by the look of things, has just about avoided the barriers. But that car would have slid for a very long way on its tyres, and I would imagine they will now look like threatening bits. Uh, yes, and there's clearly an issue because there's smoke coming out of the back of the car. There was tar marks all over the road. But again, that suggests that there was maybe some sort of failure that caused the car to spin, uh, like um, something in the suspension because the car... Oh, a wheel's loose, that's why the car suddenly pitches sideways. So there's been a, a failure in that left 
rear corner, like a, a, a wheel bearing or a wheel nut has come off or something, but the wheel is trying to part company with the car, and that's what's yeah. pictured into the spin. Yeah, or wishbone failure or something yeah. like that, because that's why, yeah. That it's a wobbly wheel, come what may. It's a definite wobbly wheel, and I think that might be, yeah, either an upright or a wishbone failure on that potential car. So, again, you never know what happens. That car is going to have to come into the pit lane, and with damage like that on the car, I'm not sure that we're going to even see that car take the chequered flag, flag I'm afraid. Chris? Yeah, the car is just coming to the pit box. Of course, it caught the team out by surprise of how close that incident happened to the entrance of pit lane. Now, it looks like it's gone off on the jacks. They're actually checking the left rear of the car. I yeah. can't quite get there from but my position here. I don't know if you guys have a better view. We haven't. It... No, we can see the same side as you, but um, it's certainly on the suspension side and that left-hand side that the problem and is. And I think I just saw the international symbol for it's done. I yep. see one of the uh, team personnel, yeah, confirming there with the team. I think, unfortunately, MP Motorsport is out. And that's with ten and a half minutes to go. That's about as cruel as it gets, especially uh, given that you need to take the checkered flag to be classified as a finisher. So big, big disappointment for the Goslers. They've come so close. And we were pondering earlier on whether last year they finished because they had sort of you know, more and more dramas as the race went on. But this, that's really cruel. It was a late retirement for them last year, it was, but yeah. it wasn't that late. No, no. no. Uh, but there's the corner that had the problem with the and wheel. And you can still see the angle of the brake disc. Yeah, that exactly. is suspension. It's rather than it be wheel failure, that's suspension failure, isn't it? Yeah. Now, whether that is it just failed or the rigors of being bounced over curbs for uh, nearly 12 hours, the team will have to try to find out. Yeah, but... Wow. Motorsport can be very cruel, can't it, on occasion? You're running around in last place, you just want to finish, Absolutely. and that happens. Yeah. Yeah, there's no justice, is there? No. The car goes to the pit box. Job done. So near, and yet so far. So, uh, in the last ten minutes of the race, ten and a half minutes of the race, the Gosselin Mercedes... Well, if they could get it out for one last lap, one last hurrah, at least to take the chequered flag, but I think even that's too big a task, isn't it? When you've been working for the best part of 12 hours, uh, the team not perhaps terribly motivated to then <laughs> set two in double quick time. No, I don't think so. Uh, Chris? Yeah, looking at that left rear, Tim came, across, Tim across came across as well. It's definitely a suspension issue. The wishbone is not in the correct location as well. It certainly looks like it's tilted more towards the right than it should be. So it's definitely a suspension issue. I don't think they'll be able to fix that in the next... What, 10 minutes, as you said, that we have left? Well, eight, nine eight. now and counting, yeah. Yeah, so job done. Big disappointment there for the Gosners. Uh, so that's two Mercedes having problems in the last few minutes. There's another one leading the way. There's another one in third and another one in fourth. Are they going to get through trouble free? Uh, let's hope so, because we really don't want any more twists or turns in the tail. It's cruel if you're running in last place, you need to drop out so, so late. If you're leading and that happens, that would be absolutely inconsolable, wouldn't it, for yeah. the team? and the drivers, but at the moment, for Mauro Engel, for Lucas Stoltz, for Mikel Grenier, all of whom have put in stellar stints in the number 99 Mercedes. Remember, it qualified on pole position. It pitted at the end of the first lap of the race, ran a very different strategy to everybody else. It was until the ninth hour that it took the lead of the race, and since then, there's not been any further looking back. They continue to lead, not by a huge margin, but all of the time that they keep rattling off the laps and there aren't many more of them to do now because they're on lap number 344 they're looking good for the win because they have a 14 second lead over the team WRT BMW that's been shared by Valentino Rossi by Nick Yellowly and by Dries Van Tor who drives it to the jacket flag so Mauro Engel then comes down towards turn five seven and three quarter minutes on the clock he's on lap 344 we're not going to be far away from the magic 350 number are we come the end of this but uh, Mauro Engel then on the run down now into turns six and seven. The uh, man that's been a winner in DTM races for Mercedes, in GT racing globally for Mercedes, uh, three times a winner at Macau. Came out of Formula BMW for a spell in British Formula 3, where he was the runner-up, uh, what, now 15 years or so ago. And uh, Mauro Engel, uh, for the bulk of the last decade plus, has been racing with the roof over his head, whether it's been in touring cars or GT racing or both. And uh, he's going to add yet another winner's trophy to the list as he dives now down through turn number nine. Still chasing, 14 seconds back though, Dries Van Thor. And then you've got Jules Gounon third, and that back. That's set to be Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli champion. 
and another issue potentially for Philip Ellis. Now, if it is a brake pedal and he just can't use it, he's off the road at the same place at turn five, and this time it rather looks like it's going to stay there. Yeah, it does. Uh, he's parked it up against the barriers, so he's trying to keep the car as far out of harm's way as he can to prevent any further requirement for anything other than just a localised yellow flag at this time through. Let's just have a quick look and see what happened. He tries to brake for the corner, and the car just really doesn't slow down, does it? Looks no. as though that's a similar issue for him. But I suppose he would have been cautious, knowing that yeah, yeah, that yeah. might have been the case anyway. So the car is stationary at turn five. He'll be on the radio, say, what do you want me to do? I think this is dangerous and I need to park it. And they, they might say, bring it round for one last slow lap to take the chequered flag and be classified as a finisher. But it would have to be pretty slow, wouldn't it, to have the confidence for some of the corners? Yeah, you'd be crawling your way round. You'd have to be braking on the gearbox almost, wouldn't you? Downshifting to try and slow the car up that way. So uh, out on circuit, we've still got this other good battle. We're not done adjusted yet uh, for the positions inside the top six because for fourth and fifth, the number 77 Group M car of Lucas Auer has not really fully shaken away. Joel Stern, the leading AM category car at the wheel of the number 21 uh, collection oh. car. And in fact, it has uh, they got a little bit of traffic that they need to deal with? Yes, they have. This could come into play as well. And this is going to be Scott Andrews in the Kessel Racing car that through all of those problems for Sun Energy has now taken up second in Pro-Am. And seventh overall. Uh, yeah, it's an odd one, this, because although uh, Joel Stern hasn't gone away, he's not totally caught no. either but he might do now seeing that the Mercedes in the narrow part of the circuit gets caught up by the traffic so this is Joel Sturm's big chance Ferrari which is running seventh ahead of then fourth and fifth Mercedes and Porsche and this throws Joel Sturm a lifeline doesn't it we're into the last five minutes then of 12 hours of racing and there is still an overall battle to be resolved it's for uh, fourth place our Mercedes Sturm Porsche up towards the line yeah so brilliant stuff over the start finish line they'll come and by the look of things, Scott Andrews at the wheel of the Ferrari 296 is not going to let them through. He's kept flat out over the start-finish line. He's quick through turn number one. If anything, quicker than Lucas Auer was through turn number one. So uh, Lucas hasn't quite fully caught the Ferrari yet. We're saying about Jol Stum hadn't caught Lucas Auer. Well, Lucas Auer hasn't caught the car ahead just as yet. There's an opportunity, though, up into the braking area for turn number five. But again, he's just too far back, isn't he? Unless Scott yeah. Andrews blends out of the throttle nice and early and runs wide or keeps off the throttle on the way out of the corner or moves out of harm's way, then he's still going to stay there for the moment. Why would he not? It's up to Lucas Auer, the quicker car behind, to try and feed his way through. He'll pick up the toe, though, as they head down the straight, and there could be an opportunity to the braking area for turn number six, where they'll be heading shortly. Remember that Audi pit stop that was being looked at for being short? Well, it's been converted to a 30-second time penalty after the race. It would have been a drive-through, but you can't do that because there isn't time, so now you get this 30-second penalty at the end of the race for being short on the pit stop. Uh, out of turn seven, then, comes Lucas Auer, still being chased by Joel Sturm. The gap between them at the start of the lap was only half a second, Joel Sturm is still pushing, isn't he? He has got uh, just over three and a half minutes to try to make a move, but in a straight line, the grunt of that Mercedes just extends the margin under braking and through the twiddly bits, the Porsche fights back. Uh, just looking at that Audi, 30 seconds added to its time, won't lose it a place because Lilu Wadu at the wheel of the number 20 Ferrari was 53 seconds behind right. as they came over the start finish line last time through. So, yeah, pick up the penalty, swallow. Um, and uh, the bill or the punishment that's handed in your direction, just accept it. Shouldn't lose them a place. They would still finish fourth overall in the AM category rather than dropping to fifth at this stage. So, are we going to see any further changes in the order? Has Joel Sturm got anything left that he can throw at Lucas Auer? I'm not sure he has because you'd have thought he would have caught him by now and he's still not there. Yeah, and, and he did catch, really, when they were behind the Ferrari and then Lucas Auer got away again. So, nearly, but not quite for Joel Sturm. But even so, fifth for that car, I think, is a pretty outstanding achievement over the timing line they have gone. Now, uh, where in all of this is uh, Mauro Engel, the race leader? He is on lap 346, and he's coming down towards turn 16 then at the moment. So the leading car is about to come over the timing line. Two and a half minutes to go, two more laps, I reckon. Yeah, onto the penultimate lap of the race goes Mauro Engel. So onto lap number four, 147. We thought we might get to 350. We're just going to miss out. We're going to come short by one lap, aren't we? 349 laps it will be, whereas our record here is 359 laps, which I would say 349 isn't bad, considering the fact that we had a couple of large incidents and yeah. a bit of firewall to repair well, or armco to repair. Absolutely, yeah, long caution periods, weren't they? Yeah. But uh, you can go and have a word with Mauro later and tell him that he's uh, not driven quickly enough and seem to squeeze one more <laughs> lap out of it, see what his reaction is. I, I can guess. No, yeah, I, I, I might send Alan to say that. Yeah. <laughs> so the Gripper M team looks on. Uh, the drivers, of course, will go to the podiums uh, 
post-race, we'll have the race podiums and we'll have the IGTC result podiums as well. But for the penultimate time, Mauro Engel sets up the Mercedes then for turn seven, goes through that right-hander now, back onto the power all the way down through that uh, sort of corner, that kink at turn eight. Nice flowing part of the circuit, this, it all opens up, doesn't it? That goes past that support race, start-finish area, down towards turn nine on this configuration of the Grand Prix circuit. Uh, which has been a, a, a far better corner, I think, than its predecessor. It's one that drivers really like that. Yeah, it's, it's quite banked, isn't it, mm. turn number nine? and doesn't extend quite as far as well, so that's why the track was shortened, not by much, from, what was it, 3.4 kilometres to 3.2, ultimately something like that when the amendments were done at the back end of the 2020 season, early part of uh, 2021. So Maro Engel heads underneath the W Hotel for the penultimate time round through turn number 14. You can see just how far away he is now from the barriers compared to what he was earlier on in the race when he was having to push like his life depended on it. Well, yeah. they've done all of the hard work as a team. They head round through turn number 16 and it looks as though Mercedes, AMG, Team Grouper M are now just one lap away from victory in the 12th running here of Yasmarina of the Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. One more lap to go then, through goes Mauro Engel. The teams look on. Uh, that's the BMW WRT squad at number 46, looking at Dries van Thor, who goes over the timing line now. And the margin starting the last lap is 12.7 seconds. It's come down a smidge, but not enough to really give Mario Engel any palpitations. I don't think he's going to be good to go to the end with this uh, advantage. He's already up at turn five. Yep, so out of turn number five, he'll make his way down the straight, down towards turn number six. Chris? Uh, yeah, just a quick update for the 75. Engine-related issues. Uh, the team relayed to Philip to uh, basically stop the car to cause any further damage, so it's engine-related. OK, so they had the brake drama, then an engine problem on top of it. Thanks for that. Uh, no such dramas, though, for Mauro Engel coming out of Turn 7. And so from the uh, disappointment of last year, they've turned it around this year, haven't they? And uh, a, a great effort by Gripper M. And Mauro Engel is going to be the man that brings it home. He certainly is. So uh, up towards turn number nine for the final time. It comes Mauro Engel. They have had to work hard. Their strategy left them slightly exposed. They knew they had to push to make sure that they carved their way back through the order, having started from pole position, but pitting on the very last lap, uh, sorry, the very first lap of the race. And from there, they managed to tick off of the 10 imposed pit stops. They ticked off three of them in the first one hour and 40 minutes. Mercedes have won here before at the Golf 12 hour, but the 12th running of it here at Yas Marina, the Lenovo Golf 12 hour, the win is going to go the way of Mauro Engel, of Mikel Grenier and of Lucas Stoltz and the way of Mercedes AMG Grupa M racing out of the final corner over the start finish line. And it's the third win in the Lenovo Golf 12 hours for Mercedes. Mauro Engel, Mikel Grenier and Lucas Stoltz claim the win we wait for Dries van Thor to come over the start finish line and the team WRC BMW of Valentino Rossi, Dries van Thor, and Nick Yellily will finish in second place. But in terms of the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli, David, that's going to go the way, the title of Jules Gounon. Who's going to be third in the race. It is a second Mercedes AMG race win within IGTC this year. But for uh, Jules Gounon, he crosses the line now and Jules Gounon wins the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli. There are celebrations already at Grupa M. Uh, there's a celebration going on at BMW for second place and there'll be celebrations at Mercedes AMG Team 2Cs for Jules Gounon as well. Third in the race, but the points for that give him the championship, give him the title in IGTC uh, to add to another stellar season for him. Uh, so much to celebrate up and down the pit lane. Now, what about the classes? Uh, because uh, we're going to have then fourth and fifth come over the line in a moment. Lucas R will be fourth in the race, fourth in pro, fourth in IGTC. But then behind, we're looking for number 21 because that is Joel Sturm, who is set to win Am as a very happy Valentino Rossi walks up the pit lane to go to the podium. Uh, well, he was uh, there once before, but second place overall. He's going to be elated with that as Carl Grenier joins in the celebrations. Uh, right, fourth and fifth are about to emerge from turn 16 as you look at the celebrations. Lucas Al taking fourth and fifth of the AM category win to Joel Sturm, Constantin Dresler and Dustin Blattner. Brilliant effort that for Car Collection Motorsport. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, the Pro-Am win goes the way of the number 27 car 
uh, that were shared over the course of that race. The Optimum Motorsport McLaren, Mark Radcliffe, Ollie Milroy and Rob Well. Uh, all of the drivers, you can see the emotion in the pit lane. Valentino Rossi looks very happy indeed. That <laughs> traditional <laughs> smile and the wave from him. Uh, uh, he is on the podium. Yep, second overall, Valet. That's absolutely right. And it's yet another trip, isn't it, to the Lenovo Gulf 12-hour podium for the nine times Motorcycle World Champion. Uh, Mara Engel driving off the road there to get pick up on the tyres. And is he going to do some donuts? He is in front of the bar at the W Hotel. So the uh, fans that are there will now end up with uh, a fair amount of tar smoke in their drinks. But never mind, Mara Engel doing this in style. Celebrates a race win to round out the IGTC season. And... Uh, <laughs> Talk about how much you can see with the floodlights. You can't see a great deal in all the tar smoke now. Mara, I think, has even backed it onto the circuit. So, uh, at least he was smoking outside the hotel. That's true, that's true. And a delighted Jewel Gounon joins in. Anything Mara can do, I can do better, he says. <laughs> so uh, the new champion, Jewel Gounon, celebrates then, lights up the tyres. That's another set of Pirellis that you don't need anymore. And uh, continues to put 11s on the line as he comes all the way now down through the final few corners. The uh, photographs, selfies are being taken. Mikhail Grenier there walking up the pit lane uh, for one of his bigger wins. Eve Witt, Charles' father, just goes through shots on the uh, left as you look. And so the teams, the engineers, making their way for overall podium, for IGTC podium, for Pro-Am, for AM, for independence. Uh, but uh, at the end of 12 hours, just getting to the finish is an achievement. And I don't say that to rub it into the likes of Sun Energy One or the Gosners, but no. you know, it does underline that you can never take anything for granted. That's, that's why we love endurance racing, is it? That's why we love the whole dynamic of endurance racing. Uh, sprint racing, a bit more cut and thrust, but yeah, endurance racing. It's all about the team effort, isn't it? It's the mm. proper team game in short endurance racing because you know, you've got to think about your team, the mechanics, your co-drivers, and only when it all clicks together does the win come together. And <laughs> 99, that car there, uh, Mercedes AMG, Group M, they certainly rolled the dice on strategy. And they got it right as well. So well done to Mara Engel, to Lucas Stoltz, to Mikhail Grenier, and uh, Valentino Rossi looking for his car. There it is. Dries Van Thor arrives out, gets a delighted Mara Engel, and Jules Gounon. In a moment, he's going to step from number 14, the two C's. Mercedes on the uh, far right as you look. He's our new Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli. Champion, out he gets. So the congratulations of the Mercedes AMG hierarchy. And Dries Van Thor, who looks like he's in a bit of discomfort after that stint as well. So talk about it being the less comfortable or less uncomfortable option. Um, he might argue, because although that pedal box was supposedly set for the shorter stature, he too has rather suffered in those last couple of hours. Yeah, you'll be uh, heading to the airport later on, and if you see three people limping ahead of you, yeah, you'll, you'll know what car they've been driving. Yeah, indeed. So. I know, it might be our commentator alongside me, <laughs> David Addison. <Come> so, <laughs> Pirelli hats to the yes, victors. Yes. Jules Gounon then. Congratulate them and they say well done on your championship, but that means a lot to Mauro Engel. Uh, he's uh, won many a race and many a title, but that means a lot. Well done Mauro, well done to Lucas Stoltz, to Mikhail Grenier. They look up from the photographs and wave to the fans and in due course the podium uh, will welcome them. It certainly will, yeah, you can see uh, more congratulations coming in now as well. <laughs> <laughs> Still has the athleticism to leap off the bonnet of the Mercedes and it's fair to say for these drivers you know they don't get much of a Christmas off they'll fly back home they'll spend a bit of time with their families but for a good chunk of them they'll be heading to Daytona Rolex 24 and the Raw before the 24 the three-day test that takes place all is going to happen throughout January that's right so limited time off as you say and then there's the start of the IGTC season some of them will be doing the Dubai 24 hours as well which is what early January second weekend of January uh, so some of these cars will stay out here and prepped over here and I mean there are some GT3 cars that, that take part in IGTC that never go back to base they are always being shipped around the world from continent to continent and come out of the container get to the circuit and that's where they're prepped I think we might be able to hand down to Chris to maybe get some reaction from down there in Park Ferme indeed we will I got Mara Engel here the winner uh, when you leaked off the car I got out of breath for that I can't imagine what's going through your head right now you started leading in the ninth hour of the race, the final three hours, you pretty much controlled it. The team were very reserved as well. I did speak to them and they said it might happen and it did. Yeah, look, uh, um, it's amazing. We're, we're, we're really, really happy because uh, it's been a long time coming with, with Group M. We've had three pole positions. We've had a competitive car pretty much all, all year and it just didn't come together. And 
So to make this one all the more, all the more sweeter and uh, to deliver the manufacturer's championship for, for Mercedes AMG and for Jules to clinch the driver's championship is, is the icing on the cake. And I spoke to you about four hours ago asking about the brakes and well, I've got my answer and the world's got their answer as well. You didn't need to change the brakes at all. Well, to be honest with you, I really didn't know. <laughs> Are they spongy at the moment? No, they're still good. Uh, I'm not sure if they can go for another 12 hours, but uh, they, they felt surprisingly good still. Well, let's see if we can get the team to join in with us. I'll try to get a word with Lucas Saltz, but congratulations. Let's go talk to Mikael and Luca. You guys were confident there towards the end. I did speak to you briefly. I think it was about 20 minutes before the end. You guys were watching the screens. You knew what Team WRT were doing, but you had the confidence in uh, Maro here. You guys must be elated, right? Yeah, I mean, we know that Mauro likes to finish races. Uh, so I had full trust in him. Obviously, you never know what, what can happen in the last few hours, but uh, he did a really nice job. Yeah. The team did a nice job, Luca as well, a good strategy. Uh, we were a bit unlucky at the start of the race, but good to win the race. Yeah, just just outstanding job by the Group M guys. Um, they, they really deserve it. They, they faced a difficult year, and I, I joined them for the last two races, and we had two podiums now. So I'm, yeah, just, just really, really happy and proud. And uh, today was a special day. Uh, Dries made us a bit nervous in the end. Um, but yeah, Mauro is confident to finish the race. And yeah, I think now we celebrate. Well, congratulations once again to Group M. Let's go see if we can find the BMW M4 uh, crew here with Dries Van Thor, Valentino Rossi, unless they've gone up already. Well, Nick Yellowoy is here, uh, but he is on his way up. Uh, Dries Van Thor is actually here. Dries. That was a fantastic stint there, just enough, not enough time left on the clock, right? Well-deserved second place, though, to be honest. Yeah, it was tough. Uh, I gave it everything I had. Um, our pedal box got broken, so uh, it was, I got a bit of cramps at the end, which was not nice. Um, I tried. I mean, the car was working really well the whole weekend, so uh, really a big thanks to WRT and BMW for, for I mean, getting us the package we have. Um, hey, uh, good one. Um, but yeah, we just didn't have enough this weekend. Well, of course, we congratulate you on second place. I know it's a bit of sweet one, but still, uh, you did a very good job there, especially like, trying to get that time back. Now, let's see if we can find the third place finishers. They may have already gone up already. So uh, I'll just throw it back up to the commentary box and I'll see who else I can find to get some last minute words from. Chris, thanks for now. So uh, we've got the podium being made ready. We've got all the photographers spilling onto the track. This new podium that comes across the pit lane. Uh, and uh, therefore, rather than being at the front of the race control building, as it used to be, is uh, a little bit further down the pit lane, but it gives uh, better views for everybody, really, for the press or on the track, for the fans of the grandstands, particularly at the Grand Prix, they'll be able to uh, share in that. And uh, drivers then making their way through the garages. There'll be teams' representatives to get up there as well. But Mauro Engel, Lucas Stoltz, and Mikhail Grenier, the heroes of the 12 hours here. Uh, at the Yas Marina, the Lenovo Golf 12 hours won by that Mercedes, which has hardly got a mark on it, hardly a scuff mark. Mercedes retaining its manufacturer's title. Uh, Jules Gounon following Danny Juncadea, who won the driver's crown here last year. Luca Stoltz up from fourth to second in the driver's uh, standings. And Mario Engel's second IGTC victory. It's only Gripper M's second IGTC win. The other was uh, Suzuka back in 2018. Uh, Mario Engel also featured in that one as well. So... Uh, <laughs> You kind of get tricked a bit on IGTC because there are relatively few races to a season. Uh, but uh, we've had some great events and great races. And although it wasn't the, the, the biggest of entries, and it's a shame that we did lose cars even pre-event yep. uh, and pre-qualifying. You know, the couple, for various reasons, didn't get as far as qualifying. We lost two in the qualifying session as well, and then the earlier dramas. But there was always something to be looking at, wasn't there? And that battle towards the end for fourth, fifth, and, and sixth, and then uh, uh, problems mechanically for the Sun Energy car prove that it ain't over till it's over. Now, as ever, it serves up an absolute treat, the Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. And, and yet again, it's uh, been another fantastic race, another brilliant weekend. And, you know, we've got some new race winners. We have never had wins for Mario Engel, for Mikael Grenier, or for Lucas Stoltz in this no. race before. No. And for Mercedes now, that is three times that it is a Mercedes that has won this race. We saw two Cs win in 2021 in a McLaren, but they did win a Mercedes here January last year. So uh, 12 months ago, we saw a whim 
for Mercedes here, January of uh, 2022. Uh, but let's just confirm the results then. It is Maruengo, Lucas Stoltz and Mikel Grenier that claim the win. Valentino Rossi, Dries van Thoren, Nick Yellily in second place. Shul Guna, Maxi Goetz and Fabian Schiller were there in third ahead of Lucas Auer, uh, Ferrari and Frank Bird that was there in third. Then it was Dustin Blatter, Christian Jezza and Joel Strum that finished in fifth place with Mark Ratcliffe, Ollie Milroy and Rob Bell completing the top six. It was the Ferrari there of uh, Daz Pereira, Roda, Andrews and Fuminelli that was there in seventh place with the... Um, uh, Al, Heinemann and Caroli's Porsche completing the top eight. So, uh, uh, Isra Abdullah Al-Khalifa was there in ninth from Ian Loggy and uh, Faisal al Zabair and completed the top ten. Daniel Alaman, Ralph Bone and Alfred Renauer with their Porsche. Then it was the Cozzi, Riviera, so, uh, uh, Senna Giotto and Pulcini Ferrari that was in 11th place with Kevin C. Eddie Cheever, Jonathan Hoy and Chris Froggart 12th but for Hoy that's enough to claim the Independence Cup as well and then you can see just outside of the top 15 Sun Energy finished uh, in 17th position but with 10 laps adrift we don't think they'll be classified as a finisher because they did not take the chequered flag and everybody from 17th downwards was either unfortunately unable to take the start of the race or unable to take the finish of the race. And as we say, we lost a few along the way, but as ever, it was a fantastic Gulf 12 hours. The 12th running of it here at Yas Marina. The 13th Lenovo Gulf 12 hours in total. It kept us guessing all the way, didn't it? And again, the way that those 10 regulation pit stops have to be factored in means you get that great divergence of strategy. So there is always something going on. There's always a car in the pits, it feels like. There's always a driver change. There's always a story. Uh, and another Mercedes victory. Jules Gounon then celebrating his uh, uh, title as Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli. Championship winner, Mario Engel on the far uh, right as you look, talking to Dries van Thor, celebrating a race win. On the other side of the garage, you've got Lucas Stoltz. Michael Graney was peeking out a shot a moment ago, but uh, in a few moments, the drivers are going to be called forward. And we are just about ready, I think, for the podium with Alan Hyde. Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. First of all, the AM Winners Podium. Presenting the AM Winner Trophies, Pirelli Circuit Activity Manager, Matteo Braga, onto the podium to make the presentations and we will welcome the drivers onto the podium in reverse order, starting with third place, car number seven, Herbert Motorsport, Daniel Alleman, Ralph Byrne, and Alfred Renauer onto the podium for third place. Second place on the AM winners podium, Car number three for the Two Seas Motorsport team, Isa bin Abdullah Al Khalifa, Ian Loggy, and Al Faisal and Zubair. <laughs> and first place on the AM Winners podium, the Car Collection team, Car 21, Dustin Blattner, Constina Dressler, and Joel Stern. And we will also welcome a representative of the winning team who will receive a Lenovo award. Presentations about to be made by Matteo Braga to all of the drivers on the podium. Handshakes, congratulations, and the trophies as well. So the trophies to the second place team, Matteo Braga congratulating them, and then the trophies to be presented to Isa bin Abdullah Al Khalifa, Ian Loggi, Al Faisal Al Zubair, and they receive their awards. And Matteo will then move on to present the trophies to our winners, to Dustin Blattner, Constantine Dressler and Joel Sturm as well on the top step of the podium and making its way onto the podium as well. Uh, Lenovo Award, our title sponsors of the Golf 12 Hours on the top step of the podium, representing our winning team, Car Collection. And so, ladies and gentlemen, your 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours am winners with their trophies.
Now for the photographs, everybody. Hold your trophies high, if you please, and we'll have photographs of all of you on the podium. That is our first podium presentation for the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours AM Winners Podium. Well done. And so the drivers will make their way off the podium to make way for our second podium presentation coming up. <laughs> Photographs taking place just behind the podium and as the AM drivers make their way away from the podium, we will stand by for the word that we're ready to get our second podium underway. And it will be for the Pro-Am winners podium for the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. And so our second podium, everybody, the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours, the Pro-Am Winners Podium, presenting the Pro-Am Winner Trophies, Yas Marina Circuit Government Relations Director, Abdullah Al Shamari, onto the podium to make the presentations. And we welcome the drivers once again in, in reverse order, starting with third place, the third place drivers of car number 33, and Terrace Al, Tim Heinemann and Mattia Caroli. Well done to all three as they make their way onto the third step of the podium. Second place for Pro-Am, representing Kessel, car number 11, Anton Diaz Pereira, Giorgio Roda, Scott Andrews and David Fuminelli. Making their way onto the second step of the podium, representing Kessel, and onto the top step of the podium. First place in the category, car number 27, Optimum Motorsport, Mark Radcliffe, Ollie Milroy, and Rob Bell. And we also have a winning team representative who will also receive a Lenovo award. So, Abdullah Al Shimari onto the podium to make the presentation of trophies. First of all, to the drivers in third place, to Anteras Al, to Tim Heinemann, and to Matteo Kiroli. At the far end of the podium. And then on the second step of the podium, representing Kessel, the drivers of car number 11, Anton Diaz Pereira, Giorgio Roda, Scott Andrews, and David Fuminelli received their trophies on the second step of the Prime Winners Podium. With a little one on the podium as well. And our winners, Mark Radcliffe, Ollie Milroy, and Rob Bell will receive their trophies. In addition to our winning team representative from Optimum Motorsport receiving the prestigious Lenovo Award. And Andrea from Golf 12 Hours has the Lenovo Award and will present that to the winning team representative. And a lovely round of applause for our Prime winners podium. Well done, everybody. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, your 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours Pro Am winners. <laughs> Trophies held high. Time for photographs. And well done to all of the drivers. And our thanks to Abdullah Al Shamari for making the presentation as the drivers make their way off the podium. They'll have a photographic opportunity as they walk down the walkway to the podium. Brand new podium here at Yas Marina Circuit. And a, a beautiful podium it is that uh, traverses the pit lane over the bridge and onto the podium. So photographs of our second place drivers. 
photographs of our winners as well. And then we'll have our third place drivers having their photographs as well. We prepare ourselves for the next podium. And so our second podium is complete. We move on to podium number three, the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours overall winner's podium. And we get the drivers onto the podium in reverse order, starting with third place drivers representing Two Seas Motorsport, number 14, Jules Gounon, Maximilian Goetz, and Fabian Schiller onto the podium. Car number 14. On the second step of the podium, car number 46, representing Team WRT, Valentino Rossi, Dries Van Thur, and Nick Yellerly. And on to the top step of the podium, in car number 99, representing Grupa M Racing, Lucas Daltz, Mikhail Grenier, and Mauro Engel. And we have a representative of the winning team representing Grupa M Racing. As the winners make their way onto the top step of the podium to the applause of the crowd. Well done, car number 99. Handshakes with all of the other drivers on the podium. And once they appear on the top step of the podium, we will have the national anthem. Well done to our winners of the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. Presenting the overall winners and team representative trophies, representing Lenovo, the EMEA Chief Marketing Officer, Alberto Spinelli will make the presentations and also presenting medals for the Intercontinental GT Challenge proud by Pirelli winners, Series Manager, Abby Hay, to present the medals to all of our drivers on the podium. The overall top three, also the overall top three in the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli. And trophies being handed out now by Alberto Spidelli for the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. And also by Abby Hay for the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli winners. A few more trophies to hand out. And as Alberto presents those trophies to our winners with hearty congratulations, beautiful trophies these as well, the spoils of victory for a super, super race. Not a simple race, a well-earned top step of the podium. Your 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours overall winners, everybody, well done. And as they pose with their trophies for the cameras, can we have a photograph of all of the drivers with their trophies, please? Posing for the cameras. Trophies, everybody, that's it. With your trophies high in the air for the uh, many photographers from around the world. Well done to all of them. And now I think it's time for celebrations.
<laughs> so it's still getting caught out of bottles. Be careful with the podium, everybody, it's new. So celebrations all around. A, a very, very happy podium. And uh, great to see all of them celebrating after a grueling 12 hours here at the As Marina circuit, celebrating with sparkling rose water. And as they chink bottles, uh, maybe a chance for the drivers to come to the front and have a final podium picture. They are your winners for the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 hours. Well done. More podiums yet to come, everybody. And podium caps are thrown down from the podium into the crowd. There are plenty of them as well. <laughs> some of the marshals managed to get some of the podium caps. Uh, I'm sure they will take pride of place as the drivers make their way off. There'll be a final opportunity for photographs as they make their way down the walkway. And Happy, smiling, two C's motorsport team make their way down. Gilles Gounon, Maximilian Gertz and Fabian Schiller to have their final photographs. And Max Gertz is still on the podium, still enjoying the moment and is about to leave the podium, come down the walkway. I think our winners are waiting for one man, One man, and that's, and that's Mark Ryan to, to join them for a photograph. And Mauro Engel smiling away as he makes his way up to his teammates to pose for the cameras. Max Gertz makes his way past the winners. And TV cameras are there. Photographers are there as well. And that should conclude our third podium for the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. Overall winners on the podium. So the last driver to leave the podium, Valentino Rossi, smiling and waving to all of the drivers that are standing by for podium number four. And we are just about ready for our fourth podium after an exciting <laughs> final at the Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. The title for the 2023 Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli Independent Cup was decided today, presenting the trophies the CEO and founder of SRO Motorsports Group, Stefan, Stefan Rattel, and, and series, series manager, manager Abby, Abby Hay, to, to present, present these trophies. trophies. Third place driver, Stephen Grove and Brenton Grove. Second place driver, Anteras Al. Well done to Anteras Al. And we'll be joined by Tim Heinemann and Matteo Caroli onto the podium. And ladies and gentlemen, your IGTC Independent Cup champion of 2023 is Jonathan Huey. Well done to be joined by Kevin C, Eddie Cheever, and Chris Froggett onto the podium as well. Getting huge applause from the crowd. And Abby Hay presenting the medals. And as the medals are handed out for the title for the 2023 Intercontinental GT Challenge, proud by Pirelli Independent Cup. And Stefan Rattel and Abby Hay from SRO, Stefan Rattel organization, making those presentations. Great moments on the podium and still plenty of them down in the pit lane to offer their congratulations. These are beautiful glass trophies that are handed out. And on the top step of that podium, Jonathan Hui, joined by Kevin C, Eddie Cheever and Chris Froggett. But Jonathan Hui takes the 
number one step on the podium and they will all pose now with their trophies. Time for pictures with those trophies and hold your trophies up gentlemen. A photograph of our Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli Independent Cup decided here today at Yas Marina as part of the Lenovo Golf 12 Hours. Great moment for our Independent Cup winners on the podium. They will make their way off the podium and they will make their way to across the gantry, across the pit lane to have a final few photographs and then we'll have our final podium presentation of the day. Kevin Hui proudly carrying the 2023 Independent Cup champion board as he makes his way off the podium, armed with the trophy, armed with the medal as well. And we move on to our final podium once all the drivers have completed their photographs. The Independent Cup drivers make their way away from the podium. Someone turn the microphone on, please. And finally, the manufacturer and driver champions of the 2023 Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by the Pirelli Series. They have. But I will carry on, Jules, presenting the trophies, the CEO and founder of SRO Motorsports Group, Stefan Rattel, your 2023 IGTC driver champion is Jules Gounon. Sorry for the mic. And after a close fight to the final round, your IGTC manufacturer 2023 champion, Mercedes AMG. And receiving the award is the head of Mercedes AMG Motorsport, Chris Sagamuller, onto the podium to receive the manufacturer's award. So Jules Gounon receiving the trophy and Chris Zagamada receiving the IGTC Manufacturer 2023 Championship Award now from Stefan Rattel. And a thumbs up from Stefan Rattel and Abby Hay, Series Manager, makes her way off the podium and a Jules and Chris celebrates on the top step of the podium. One more time, give it up for your 2023 Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli champions. Well done to Jules Gounon and to Mercedes AMG Motorsports. And as Jules enjoys the final moments on the top step of the podium, that concludes our trophy presentations, five podiums at the end of the 2023 Lenovo Golf 12 Hours.